I'm going to share it to Facebook. Okay, so um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today um, in this crazy time. Hope everyone is safe um, and all our um, beloved ones. And um, um, today um, we are holding this meeting to discuss surgical techniques in glaucoma. And um, I'm, I'm very, very um, honored and humbled uh, to be joined by an expert panel of glaucoma surgeons um, um, from Egypt and Dr. Sponsor as well from um, the United States. Um, hope he can join us um, uh, shortly. Um, so today uh, we're going to discuss um, Schlem based um, surgery. Um, Dr. Yasmina Said is going to discuss it. Um, and then cyclodestructive procedures and eyes with good vision uh, or as a primary procedure with um, uh, Dr. Ahmed Mustafa Abdurrahman, uh, Dr. Tariq Shahrawi Taban, um, you know, he's going to uh, talk about uh, deep sclerectomy, non-penetrating surgery. I am going to talk about uh, glaucoma tube shunt surgery and Dr. Sponzo is going to uh, talk um, about his tube um, that uh, he uh, actually puts um, in case of a failed barbell or AMED uh, glaucoma drainage implant. Um, so um, thank you so much for joining us again. Um, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Yasmin Sayed. Uh, Dr. Yasmin is a professor of ophthalmology at the uh, Asraf Aini uh, Faculty of Medicine, Cairo University. She's a glaucoma consultant. Um, in uh, Cairo University Hospital and um, in Abu Rish Hospital. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Yasmin, for agreeing to participate despite the short notice. Um, and uh, she's going to be talking about the um, Schlem Canal based surgeries in glaucoma. Um, please go ahead. And if, uh, Dr. Yasmin, if you can also, um, Dr. Responsel is in. Dr. Responsel is in. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Responsel. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, I'm doing it on my cell phone because I've tried two different computers and they're not uh, helping. But uh, I, I'll keep working on getting the computer so I can do slides. Okay, uh, okay. You still have uh, got a little bit of time because, um, I think you're, um, as we were just saying, you're scheduled to um, speak last, um, but okay. not least, of course. Well, so, thank you. Um, Dr. Yasmin is going to start. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So my talk um, is going to be about incisional stem canal procedures that involve the whole circumference of the angle uh, as a way to escape the more invasive uh, glaucoma surgery during the trap and tube. Of course, lab based procedures do still have an important role in bringing down the pressure to the lower teens, uh, albeit we're not very, most of us do get disappointments from time to time over the long and short term uh, from the lab related complications. So there's always been a constant urge to address the more physiological outflow pathways to the uh, Schlems Canal and the, the adjacent trabeculum. So as we all know, the inner wall of Schlem's canal and the adjacent just juxta can refer to the them offers the highest resistance to the aqueous outflow. So if you manage to incise that and treat this area of the angle, you can promote more flow towards the distal passages through the collector channels and beyond. And 
angle-based surgeries are not new. They've always been the gold standard treatments for uh, pediatric glaucoma patients, either through an ad internal approach, you can see the angle of the glaucoma or an ad external trabeculotomy. And over the past few years, there's been, um, again, a surge in angle surgeries in adult patients, starting with the chabectome, and now the latest is probably the Kahoot Geoblade, which is a single-use device that can help you create an excision of a strip of the inner wall of Schrems canal through gonioscopic view again. But then again, over the past years, there's been a growing body of evidence pointing to the fact that the bigger extent your incision is, the more you're bound to have a lower pressure over the long term and short term. So uh, if you increase the extent of your incision, it's less likely to scar over time. You're adjusting more collective channels over the distal outflow pathway, especially the ones in the intranasal quadrants, which, are, which have a more high distribution of collective channels. So as you can see here, uh, the results are much in favor of doing circumferential incisions. Um, mo these studies mostly are in pediatric eyes, but there's no reason not to extrapolate that to adult eyes as well. There's only one study I'm aware of that compared uh, circumferential suture trabeculotomy, that's ab external trabeculotomy, uh, to uh, 120 to 160 degree trabeculotomy with the rigid poke trabeculotomy. And as you can see here, the results in both the primary and secondary open angle glaucomas have, very, have been very much in favor for circumferential incisions uh, of the angle. Now, the more important question is to compare circumferential to the philosophy of Chaz. And unfortunately, there's only one study, and that's by Zainab Akhtas and co-workers from Turkey. They published a retrospective uh, letter to the editor, really, that uh, showed that uh, after 12 months of follow-up, both the CHADS and circumferential trabeculotomies did more or less the same in terms of IP and survival, which was an, an amazing uh, uh, result. Uh, and the risk of hypotony was obviously more with the CHAD uh, cases. And the first to come up with the circumferential trabeculotomy technique were uh, Beck and Lynch back in 95, where they used the cone suture with the bump. Um, and you can insert that to one end of Schlem's canal after a cut down, and then you keep on pushing until it comes out of the opposite side. Of course, this is a patient with pediatric glaucoma and a, and a hazy cornea, but if you get a chance to check that with a gonial lens intraoperatively, then you can, um, less like, you're less likely to lose it on the way. And once it appears from the opposite side, you pull it out and create your circumferential incision. So obviously the problem here with the suture trabeculotomy is the risk of creating hook passages. And there have been some reports of it becoming misdirected into the supracoidal and subretinal cases. So with the introduction of the eliminated microcatheters, the risk of going into false passages has been markedly reduced. Uh, so what the microcatheter allows you to do is to track the passage. The eliminated tip allows you to see the end of the microcatheter. So if it becomes misdirected, you can get it out and redirect it. And if it's going into the wrong passage, you can uh, use an alternate method like a, a rigid trabecular foam like we're doing here and still be able to complete the incision circumferentially through the part that has gone through uh, with your uh, eye track or the previously used local light. The problem with the microcatheter is the cost and availability, which is something we all probably have to consider in the coming uh, okay. years, two uh, months or uh, years probably in light of what's going on. So what we uh, started doing over the past few oh, years and deep. really uh, got yeah. good results with that is the two sides mm. of the clotomy, where we perform two abnormal to the clotomies, one 80 degrees apart. Probably one based on the supranasal and the other on the intratemporal septum. And, um, mm -hmm. And you, you tend to get away from the spear quadrant unless you need it for another trabeculectomy or a blood-based procedure, a valve. And uh, this is an aphatic eye, by the way, and the results are amazing in aphatic uh, glaucoma patients. And as you can see here, after you uh, identify the stem scan and de roof it, uh, we, we do a scratch in the roof just to make sure that you're in the correct plane and to make sure that the floor is still patent because sometimes you do identify the canal but the probe, the, the chabecular foam can inadvertently go into a wrong passage. So just to make sure that you're starting in the proper place, just a small scratch in the roof without, without having to de-roof it. And with the Bridget probe going in, you need to always make sure you're equidistant from the limbus 
And uh, if you're not scratching the roof of Schlem's Canal, then you're probably perforating the floor, which is something you don't want to do because it would mean that you would go into the anterior chamber prematurely. And one of the short signs is having a high femur here, as you can see here previously. So the high femur in these cases, when you cut in through the Schlem's Canal and connect it to the anterior chamber, should be a very gradual, slowly percolating uh, bleeding. If you get intense high femur, then it's probably because uh, the eyes briefly or something was injured on the way. But the high prima resulting from the high popping is a gradually percolating uh, bleeding. And our group from Cairo University compared the microcatheter assisted ab external trabeculotomy to the two side technique in pediatric glaucoma. And the results, as you can see, were very compatible. Uh, so yeah, we've been doing it for a while. But the problem, of course, with ab external techniques is that you violate the conjunctiva, which is a very precious structure for glaucoma surgeons, as we all know, lest you need it for a blood-based procedure later on. So for this, uh, in 2014, uh, Feldman and Grover came up with the GAT procedure, which, which is an ab internal trabeculotomy. Uh, GAT stands for gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy. And it's basically an ab internal circumstantial trabeculotomy. I'll show the video quickly and then we'll go through it step by step uh, to show you some tips. So you basically create a goniotomy like incision under gonioscopic view, and then you gain access. Once you gain access to the Schlem's canal, you go in with a proline feature or a microcatheter, and you thread it through the Schlem's canal circumstantially with the checkpony microforceps. And you keep on pushing until it reappears from the opposite side. And once it's out, and this is the, 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 the funnest part of the procedure, you just fold, grip both ends and pull it out. So you create your circumferential incision uh, through simply two corneal uh, paracentesis. Now, as you can see here, the blood reverses into the canal once uh, the inner wall is opened and, and, and the globe is a bit high uh, The results have been really good. Uh, in both primary and secondary open angle glaucoma, maybe a bit better for secondary open angle glaucomas, particularly steroid induced glaucomas. And even the longer term results, which Helm and Global published, were quite good. You can expect a 30 to 50 percent IP reduction and the reduction in medications by an average of 22. So I basically offered most of my patients as a primary procedure. Very few patients that will need a tab if they're very advanced glaucoma or they can't be back to medications, the non-compliant patients. But for most patients, it is a suitable first time minimally invasive option. It's been, uh, the results have been published on PCG as well, in juvenile open angle glaucoma. They've been very promising. Um, and um, I'm not sure that it, somebody has been scratching my presentation. <laughs> Somebody's playing with the, with, the, uh, um, with the pen here. And, um, and, and even in eyes, amazingly, even in eyes that have had a previous incisional glaucoma procedure like a tab or tube, you can still attempt them with very good results, particularly if, the, uh, if they were a corneectomy rather than a trabeculectomy. So if the ostium did not, is not involved, uh, incorporated into the trabeculectomy, you can still get your suture or microcatheter to go through circumferentially. So I'm having a problem with this line on the screen. Dr. Muhammad, do you know how to get around that? There's a line that's appearing on the screen. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I, I don't really know where it's coming from, is it? Okay, so whoever created it is deleting it, so thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah. So going through it step by step, because when I first read about it in 2014 when they first published it, Feldman and Grover. I tried it and I thought, no, this is just impossible. I'm not doing that. This needs super human skills. But then um, somebody encouraged me to give it another chance a couple of years later and I've been all over it. So I, I'll give you the steps uh, step by step that I might convince you to, to try to attempt it in, uh, in many of your patients. So the first thing is you need to have very proper visualization of the angle. And in order to do so, you need to be familiar with intraoperative uh, gonia surgery, which is something that we all glaucoma surgeons need to start adopting because many of the minimally invasive procedures are uh, being uh, introduced at the level of the angle. Uh, so you need to be comfortable operating under a gonia lens, which is not hard to learn. And um, you need to have a proper visualization of the angle. So 
uh, you, you, first of all, you go into a temporal approach because you need the head to be tilted away from you. So it's easier to tilt the head of the patient on the laser side rather than have him in a chin down position. And then you need to tilt your microscope again away from you. So both are around 45 uh, uh, degrees and you, you, until you get the best visualization of the angle. And then you go into a 23 gauge incision with the MDR. Just make sure you're away from the limbal blood vessels because any bleeding will get underneath the lens. It will be a real mess uh, and affect visualization. You just create a very superficial incision that only involves the inner wall of Schwem's canal and the adjacent trabeculum. Make sure you don't go in deep into the outer wall and you push the posterior lid downwards to gain access into the trabeculum. And of course, you need to do that under heel and preferably heel and GD to avoid the bleeding, tamponade it. Uh, and if, if you get some blood at this point, you can elevate the patient's head uh, if you feel comfortable operating in this position. And then you go in with the proline suture. You may choose to use a catheter or proline suture. Uh, they're both, at least in my hands, they're the same, but the proline is much, uh, it comes at a much lower cost. So what you need to do is to blunt out the tip of the proline suture with a cautery, just making sure that you don't create a big knob, just smooth it out, go into a tangential incision that is pointed towards the site where you want to go in. And uh, you, before you go in, you need to make sure that uh, you, to measure up the, 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 uh, around the, the suture around the circumference of the eye. Uh, yes, so could, you, could you raise your voice, Yasmin? Yeah. Could you raise, I'm sorry for that, but sure. they are asking no. to raise your voice. Oh, sorry, please. the microphone is away. Yes, yeah. this is much better. Okay, so uh, you need to measure the suture around the corneal circumference and mark it down at that point, either with a call tree or a marker. Uh, so you can tell that you're going into the Schlems canal that is rotating. And when the site of the mark is close to the cornea, your assistant will tell you, and then you start expecting the suture to appear from the opposite side. Uh, otherwise, if it doesn't, then you need to uh, explore where it's gone. Um, and at any one point, you need to make sure that your globe is pressurized. You don't want the blood to regurgitate prematurely. And once it goes in, as you can see here, you can appreciate that there's a thin layer of tissue that's covering it that corresponds to the inner wall of Schlem's canal. And once it goes through the first quadrant, usually it will go all around at least for 270 degrees. And if it stops after three quadrants, still you can still explore it and retrieve it from there and create probably uh, a, a, a smaller uh, incision, but more than 180 degrees for sure. Uh, again, this is how it looks with a micro catheter. You may choose any of these, whichever is more convenient for you. And once it comes out of the opposite side, you grip that end and you pull both ends away and you get your incision. Sometimes you may get blood at this point, but usually bleeding appears when you start washing away the healing. And that's the main issue here with the GAT procedure is the high femur. And it's something that you need to really counsel your patients about preoperatively because it often lasts about two weeks. In 70% of patients, they're expected to have a high femur, have to be in the semi-sitting position for around two weeks post-operatively. Very few patients would have it for a longer time. And, uh, and as, I, as you start washing out your healing, you can elevate the patient's head in a Chadlinberg position, or actually I elevate it up to 90 degrees while I'm washing out. So you minimize the, the regurgitate, the regurgitate of blood uh, uh, into the anterior chamber and leave just about, just about enough healing to tamponade the blood uh, peripherally. So of course, if this was uh, uh, the, the, the best option, we would all be doing uh, GATS and circumferential trabeculotomies, but unfortunately there's still barriers to success. And the two main obstacles are, first of all, the scarring, because over time, the canal again tends to scar again. And up to this point, there isn't uh, an intracameral anti-scarring uh, drug, just like we had um, the mitomycin C uh, for, uh, to reduce the scarring of blebs. So uh, if, if, if at some point uh, we develop an intracameral drug that reduces the risk of scarring, this may revolutionize the results uh, of angle surgeries. The other problem is the health and patency of collective channels. Because remember, all this depends on healthy collective channels, which represent around one third of the resistance to outflow. So if they're not functioning in patients who've been using other drugs for a very long time or very advanced glaucomas with obliterated channels, 
uh, your angle surgery may not work as well. And there have been some studies to try to evaluate the health of angle sur of uh, collector channels, and with more developments in these investigations, we'll probably be able to, to individualize our treatments for our patients uh, better. Um, and that's it. Thank you, and stay safe. Thank you so much, Dr. Yasmin, for the amazing presentation um, on Schlem Canal based surgery. So, um, um, do any of the speakers um, have questions for Dr. Yasmin? No? So, uh, no, no, Yasmin, um, uh, if the cornea is not clear, how do you make the cornea clear for the gas procedure? Um, oh, yes. in, in, pediatric, yeah. in, in, pediatric, in pediatric glaucoma, if you have a clear area where you can start to scratch through, uh, you can start doing your goniotomy, even if it's a limited area that you can see, but just the first quadrant, if you're able to see it, you can get around doing it without having to remove an egg epithelium or whatever. I don't prefer removing the epithelium in pediatric glaucoma patients because they often end up being a failure uh, and, 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 and it, it causes a lot of pain in the early post-operative period. So um, in these cases, if I don't see the angle well, I may go for an external uh, to site trichilotomy. Dr. Yasmin, I just I want to have uh, a, one question. Uh, actually, it's a very nice presentation. My question is about two-site trabeculotomy. Uh, I found when I'm uh, doing two-site trabeculotomy that hyphema has happened more with older children, means more than two years, so the hyphema become more. Um, do you have any explanation for that, and what is your recommendation to do with this? Well, hyphema is the major problem in the circumferential cases, but the good news is it, always, it, it almost never lasts for more than two to three weeks. And I have a low threshold to go in and wash it. And I counsel my patients preoperatively that there is a chance that we may go in and do a very small procedure just to clear out the angle and so on. So I have a low threshold to wash it if it lasts for a while. Uh, and I don't have an explanation why some patients really do bleed more than others. And I have a feeling that GAT patients do bleed more than uh, to the culotomy patients. It must have to do with the, the incision itself, with the suture compared to the rigid trabeculate home. Um, I haven't really noticed that all the, all the patients do do bleed more, um, uh, but I'll, I, I mean I, I wouldn't. Um, uh, either way, I would probably wait in, with the patient in the semi-fitting position and watch it if it lasts for two days. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Yasmin. Um, um, next is uh, Dr. Ahmed Mustafa Abdurrahman. Dr. Ahmed Mustafa is a professor of ophthalmology at uh, Asr al Faculty of Medicine, Cairo University. Um, he's uh, also the founder and president of the Egyptian Society of Continuing Ophthalmic Education. And um, he's the director of the Glaucoma um, uh, Treatment and Education Center in Giza Eye Center, medical director at the uh, Giza Eye Center in uh, Cairo. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Ahmed, and he's going to talk about uh, psychodestructive procedures um, in eyes with good vision. Uh, you are welcome, my dear uh, Mohammed. Thank you very much for um, the preparation of the meeting. And then, um, and now do you see the, uh, the, uh, the presentation? Yes, we okay. do. Okay, good. Yeah, so um, no financial interest related to this. And definitely there is no conflict about the fact that cycloablation is useful in painful blind eyes. There is a general consensus regarding this. Uh, so with cycloablation, we mean destruction of the ciliary body to reduce the equus humor. It is generally indicated in refractory glaucomas. And refractory, it means refractory in relation to trabeculectomy, whether it's likely to fail or already have failed or not feasible to do a trabeculectomy. So that this is the definition of refractory glaucoma. So I'm just asking the, the participants the, just to think what's the percentage of hypotony after cycloablation? Is it less than 20%, 50%, 75%, 100%? Just think about that. What's the percentage of that? Then I will go just through some clinical cases 
So this is a 35 year old male with a history of cataract surgery. It seems like a complicated cataract surgery when you see. And then the pressure is 50, and they're all medications with advanced damage uh, to the optic nerve. So when you look at the eye, you can see this is a hard intraocular lens, but I can't see the haptic. So the, the whole anterior segment is disorganized, and I don't want to play with this eye. So I just did a cycloablation, and now the pressure is 11, and you can see how much of the reaction to uh, the diode laser, it's not very severe. The eye is relatively white immediately after treatment. This is another scenario for a patient with nanophthalmus where the axial length is 16.4. So that you, these are very frightening. We are very straight from those eyes and you can see the biometric 62. So it's quite short eyes. And now she's a 22 year old girl with uh, presented with a pressure of 45 in one eye and 37 in the second eye under all treatments. So I'm afraid to open uh, those eyes. I know we can do a kind of scleral resection, but it's much easier for me to go for cycloablation. Some cases here with the anterior chamber intraocular lens and after vitrectomy, so that diode looks a very good option, post keratoplastin and effective and even vitrectomy. So those eyes are difficult to be managed with other options. Again, similar situation, keratoplasty and the pseudophagic eye, difficult to do anything. And in this patient, the conjunctiva is completely plastered with loss of all subconjunctival tissue, probably whether aging or due to the excessive anti-glaucoma medication. We cannot do anything else except diocycloablation. Now we can see this patient with massive elevation of the epicleral venous pressure uh, due to a congenital heart disease and interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. She comes to the uh, clinic with the oxygen tank so that the pressure is 30 under all treatments and she's having new vascularization and 0.2 visual acuity one eye, the other eye is absolute. And you can see how much the vessels are affected by the uh, elevation of the epithelial venous pressure. Now I cannot touch this eye except with diocycloablation so that I offered the patient this option and I was happy that the patient received diode with the intravenous injection of bevacizumab and then the pressure drops to 16 for three months right now and the, the vision is remained like the preoperative level. So I'm so happy that I didn't do something very aggressive to this eye. So in situations where the outflow is obstructed, like elevation of the epithelial venous pressure, it looks wise that we can go for something that would decrease the equus production rather than enhancing the equus outflow. Again, a one-eyed patient, 67-year-old, one-eyed male, and you can see that the complicated cataract surgery with some repair uh, to the iris with anterior chamber lens. Now he was referred to the clinic with pressure of 40 and the best corrected visual acuity 0.1, and then you expect how much the optic nerve will look like. So that's massively damaged optic nerve. And then after treatment, the, uh, with, I mean with cyclophotocoagulation, the pressure is 12. Yes, he's receiving some medications as well, but at least he's in a much better situation. And this is the other eye was almost non-functioning and it's still a concealed eye. A 33-year-old male, high myopic male, and you can see the patient developed retinal detachment, underwent parsifana vitrectomy, and you can see the interior iridectomy, and then he's referred with retina on, but the pressure is 43 under all treatment. Now, this patient received the micropulse, and immediately after treatment, he developed decompression retinopathy with a lot of retinal hemorrhage that cleared with time, and the pressure is now 17 under all treatment. So that it's almost the same. He's receiving treatment, but he stopped uh, the systemic carbonic anhydrase therapy, and he's having the pressure in a uh, better range, and he's functioning and working with this on the eye, because the other eye, as you can see, is tattooed because of just cosmetic appearance. Uh, again, another case of a surge Weber syndrome. And with the surge Weber syndrome, you can see the, the, the choroid is thickened here. This is, this is the situation of right eye. And the left eye was lost because she received a kind of radiotherapy to choroidal angioma. So she's moving with the right eye and the pressure is quite high with this eye. And then you can see that also that the vessels in the, um, in the, the vessels are engorged in the epithelial space so that Again, those are patients where I feel comfortable not opening those eyes. So the pressure was 35 under all treatment. It's now 20 under CUSOFT. I'm not, yeah, I feel comfort with this situation. So what's happening with cycloablation is expansion of the indication. So nowadays there are talks about the use of, uh, of uh, cycloablation in primary glaucoma. Definitely it's a refractory glaucoma, recurrent glaucoma after valve implantation. And in primary glaucomas, and it's, uh, they are talking about that like uh, three years now, 
with some uh, some push towards to be used in primary uh, as a primary therapy, and it's definitely applied to eyes with good visual accuracy because of the mess that um, cycle ablation for blind eyes. No, it's applied to eyes with good visual accuracy, definitely. Now, if we check the serious complications, it's almost hypotony, but the range of hypotony is from 0 to 17. It's not high. It is especially high in neovascular glaucoma because we tend to treat those eyes aggressively. But in other forms of glaucoma, the incidence of hypotony is not quite high. Now, if we check the available techniques available in the market around us, we have the transesclerial diode. I think all of us almost have this kind of treatment. And then endoscopic, I personally don't have, and I think it's available in many centers, the micropulse and the high intensity focus ultrasound. So this, these are the common techniques present worldwide. And this is the set of uh, cycloablation that I have. And I like it because this is the continuous wave diode, which is regular one. And then this is the micropulse, and this is the high intensity focus ultrasound, so that I have all those means to manage the patients. Now, if we check the technique for the classic transescleral diode, you know the classic transescleral diode. There is no problem with that. We apply like uh, 24 shots, uh, and then the, the parameters, usually we go for a relatively low power, so that I use like 100, uh, 1,500 milliwatts with duration of three seconds. And then we treat like that. And the point that we leave like half width of the probe, uh, of the uh, G probe, uh, in between the burns, so that it is like circumferential treatment, leaving the horizontal uh, meridia. Now, this is the picture of the eye. This is one of the faults of the eye post-operative, so that I don't like that appearance, because it seems like they are not regularly and not homogeneously distributed around the, the limbus, so that, uh, and we can get a kind of uh, scleral thinning, which is cosmetically sometimes annoying to the patient. And also, I don't like that appearance because of having uh, a, a confluent uh, laser treatment. Yes, the pressure might be controlled, but again, I don't feel happy with that. And the patient feels also that there is something wrong uh, in this eye. So what happens nowadays, and this is, I'm trying just to titrate the procedure because uh, I think there is, a, 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 there is a growing need for that. What I'm doing uh, like that is that I use the corneal marker they are using with keratoplasty. And then I stain the marker and then I stain the cornea. This will put on the cornea 16 marks. And for those 16 marks, I leave the two horizontals without treatment to avoid treating the long ciliary. And then I'm left with six marks superior and six marks inferior. So that you have one or two options to treat along those marks. You can treat one mark and then put one on the mark and then one in between. That will result in homogeneous. Um, application of the burns, but actually what I'm doing, uh, and I'm testing this, and the results are being collected, that I apply two treatments along the same line, one on the limbus and one like one millimeter behind, so that I don't have massive treatment to the ciliary body. It is just like treating the ciliary body and leaving areas untreated. So, um, and the results are really encouraging so far. Let's see how this, uh, how I'm doing that. I use the corneal marker. Again, we just stain the blades. They are not cutting blades, just marking. And then just leaving the marks to print on the cornea. And afterwards, uh, I will get the laser probe. And then I will start the treatment. Usually I will treat one on the very near to the limbus as described. And then I will slide the probe one millimeter behind. Then I will do another treatment. So in this way, I will apply 24 applications, leaving spaces untreated in between. And since I have been doing that for almost like a year, I'm so comfortable and the results are being collected to evaluate that technique. This is another situation where you can look at this eye. Again, it is a complicated cataract surgery or like capsule. It is, um, you know, that um, it might be some vitreous, but and the cornea is steamy due to the pressure as well. And some of those patients are one eye, so that's not easy to operate actually. And then again, we have a nice discussion with the patient that we will go for cycle ablation. And then I mark the cornea. We give peribulbar anesthesia, of course. And then I will start treatment again. I will spare the two horizontal ones. Uh, so the two horizontal ones are spared, whether these two or these two. And then again, I'm quite sure I'm away from the horizontal media and I apply 24 shots 
and then for a power of 1,500 milliwatts and for a duration of three seconds. So that's what I'm doing uh, nowadays. Now, th she is the girl with the Serge Weber syndrome. She has received the treatment like a couple of months ago. And then again, with the same policy and with the pressure is not the control nowadays. Now I'll switch to the other uh, technology available, which is the MicroPulse, and I think it's now um, getting some popularity. It's called the ciliary body mix, because it's mild treatment to the ciliary body, of course. And then the treatment is a kind of massage to the limbus, the superior and inferior limbus, and sparing the horizontal meridian. And this is the machine usually we set as uh, 2000 milliwatts and 80 seconds uh, duration. And the cycloablation procedures are considered like an outpatient procedure. So, so they are easy to conduct. Uh, the probe has a kind of orientation uh, and I used to mark this side uh, to be uh, on, the, on the side of the limbus. And then I keep uh, massaging the limbus at the way prescribed. And, um, I think you will not hear the voice here because I'm just connected to the AirPods, but there is a countdown so that the, it, it counts down. Now, this is another interesting patient, one-eyed young patient. It seems like he was a bophthalmic eye, but he is now 30 years old, and then he, he had retinal detachment, so he underwent vitrectomy, and the pressure was so high, and uh, then he has a Zen implant, and then it was so much scarred, I tried to um, I tried to needle and it didn't work actually and the pressure is in the 40s range. So that um, I, I told the patient, he's one eye patient, massive damage to the optic nerve. I will go for micro pulse in the first place. And that's what I have done. And also with the micro pulse, I tend to like mark the sclera so that I always have a kind of orientation to myself. Now the company, a few months ago, have released another probe for the MicroPulse, which is called the device MicroProbe P3, and they say that it has a better um, angulation and better treatment to the eye, and they have reduced the time of application with that probe. And then, um, yes, and we had a nice uh, publication, uh, Dr. Yasmin and myself, we published on the MicroPulse and the pediatric age group, and we have got good results for the three months follow-up. Now, the third modality is the high intensity focused ultrasound, and this point that it was an old technology, but now they are having like small uh, uh, crystals, these are ceramic crystals. So the application is that you have a suction ring, and then you have six piezo ceramic crystals. So those piezo ceramic crystals, they release the high intensity focused ultrasound, which is highly focused on the, uh, to the ciliary body, actually. And then, so the procedure, it's actually, it's not a difficult procedure, but again, the patient will receive retrobulbar anesthesia. All cycloablative procedures are painful. And then we will put this suction ring. It, it induces pressure of 70. And then it is activated with the foot uh, uh, pedal. Uh, and then we fill with a lot of uh, saline because uh, that will minimize the heat uh, on the surface of the eye and heat inside the eye. And then we will place the, uh, the, the transducers themselves. And then this is just a demo uh, for uh, that. Yes, and uh, the machine is like that. When we start to activate, these are the six crystals. And when they activated one crystal after the other, and the whole treatment takes a few seconds. And uh, when one crystal is activated now, it gets red and then it takes a few seconds, and then there is like 20 seconds uh, relaxation between the two crystals yeah. until the whole treatment is done. So this is, this is called high intensity uh, focused ultrasound. It works through reduction of the uh, equus uh, formation and creative sclerosis outflow. Some, some clinical results, I would just share with you what we have reported that the, the first wave of treatment was on three eyes and after like a year, and we have a nice drop of the intraocular pressure of 44% reduction, and then we have a second wave, and then we will have a larger group to uh, present. Now, hypotony after cycloablation, then let us think, is it less than 20%, 50 or 75? And the question, the answer is that it's less than 20%. So that when no other option is handy or working, just think of the cycloablation. What are the advantages of the cycloablation procedures in general? 
a, a wide range of indications, as you see, rapid, extraocular, occasionally outpatient procedure, repeatable, cost-effective, and titratable. Because you might treat 180 degree to 70, so you have a chance according to the situation of the eye. Some disadvantages are vision threatening complications are possible. You have to, um, sometimes you need to repeat, sometimes it's costly, like the high intensity focus ultrasound, and no sufficient data for the effect on the endophilia. Now let us review the, uh, the indications. Um, let us consult the literature, and you know that pyramid showing the, the, uh, the evidence the strongest evidence to the lowest evidence of the systematic reviews, the strongest evidence, and then we'll come to the expert opinion. And then the cycloablative procedures for refractory glaucoma, that was a meta-analysis, and actually nothing is against uh, cycloablative procedures. And then cyclodistractive procedures for the non-refractory glaucoma, and again, good news about that. And then it was used as a primary treatment of the largest study in Nigeria, and again, you can see that um, some good results about use as a primary treatment. Again, as a primary treatment, again, in patients with good visual potential, a primary surgical treatment. So there is an escalation regarding the indication and the use of cycloablation, basically due to the introduction of milder forms and more safer forms like the micropulse and high intensity focus ultrasound. Now, I just want to dig uh, into the uh, consensus regarding the indication so that it is just that simple table that I made. If it is a painful blind eye, I think we all agree that this is a good indication. Now, if we are talking about a refractory glaucoma, like new vascular glaucoma, affected glaucoma, as a primary treatment, here there is a conf there is a, you know there is a fight between the cycloablation and the valve, so plus or minus. Refractory glaucoma as a second procedure, so if you use the valve, and then you need to augment, and here you can use it. So there is some good consensus about that. And then if it is a primary glaucoma, the secondary procedure, which means that you have the anthropicolectomy and now the, the surgery has failed, and then you can use it. Yes, there some good consensus about that. And finally, if it is um, a primary glaucoma as a primary treatment, still awaiting more results in this area. So some results are so encouraging, but again, it needs a lot of time to be uh, confirmed as a data and actually in Cairo University, we are now conducting micropulse as an initial treatment on patients with primary open angle glaucoma and we are evaluating this work through an, uh, an MD thesis and I might tell you the results once they are uh, established in the uh, So the take home message is that um, there is a wide range of uh, cyclodestructive procedures now available around you, whether the continuous wave micropulse, high intensity focus or endoscopic. Expanding indications, serious complications are rare with relatively good safety profile. Expect some repeat, and you have to tell the patient in advance. And then sometimes also I, I mix the, the, those procedures so that I can start a treatment with a micropulse as like a pre-treatment, and then I, I can use a continuous wave in a milder form so that if a patient with one eye patient and you're still afraid, you can do a micropulse. And then if you are not satisfied, you can treat like 180 degrees. And we are evaluating that technique on a group of patients. And we're so satisfied uh, so far until the final results are established with long-term uh, follow-up. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed, for um, the really great presentation. Um, actually, um, I am very pro uh, primary CPC and CPC in, uh, in, in eyes with good vision. We have been utilizing um, uh, continuous wave um, settings uh, rather than micro pulse, uh, but with uh, Gasterland's um, um, slow coagulation settings, uh, which typically delivers um, you know, less energy over a more prolonged period of time. So um, instead of like, you know, hearing a pop sound and, you know, like delivering the energy over two seconds or 2,000 milliseconds. Um, so it's really in brown eye radius, um, we um, have fixed settings of about 1250 milliwatts um, that we deliver over um, four seconds. Um, and although the, um, um, the amount of energy delivered to the um, um, 
ciliary body um, processes is probably more uh, than what is delivered with the uh, standard POP technique, um, we have seen um, less inflammation and we have compared the POP technique with this local agulation technique and we published uh, our results in um, ophthalmology glaucoma. And um, however, we just um, submitted our results uh, that uh, I presented in um, the uh, last AGS meeting last month. Yeah. Um, and and um, looking at our success rates for primary CPC. And um, it appears like when we looked at our numbers that um, it, it really works best in pseudophagic eyes um, rather than um, in eyes um, that are phagic or like completely virgin eyes. Um, and um, some of this can be attributed, um, and this is um, all speculation, to um, the, the shallower anterior chamber may be narrower angle in phagic eyes, and with the inflammation induced by um, uh, the cyclodestructive uh, procedure, uh, like, you know, some, some synechial um, angle closure, sometimes it's like, you know, we you know, we don't routinely, you cannot repeat gymnoscopy every time the patient comes or like in every post-operative patient, but um, this is our speculation and uh, our results are significantly better in sort of like guys for sure. Uh, we have seen very little CME, uh, very little uh, persistent um, inflammation, but um, in general, it's, it's a very safe procedure. Thank you so much. Um, um, wow. Can I ask? Yes, um, I like uh, the slow approach too, and uh, we go with 3,500 milliseconds at 1,450 milliwatts. Um, and that as has just been identified by Mohammed as a way of keeping down inflammation, uh, taking less risk of macular uh, reaction and, and uh, angle uh, problems down the line. Um, I used to use the titrated method, which we'd listen for a pop and turn it down 50 milliwatts, usually get up to about 2100 or something. And I, you know, you know that every time you get a pop, you're going to create some uveitis. So uh, this other technique was shown to me by a friend and I have used it ever since. And I think you get as well controlled or even possibly better with the slow, lower power than you do with the... and. It, it puts it into the realm where you, you, especially in these situations we have right now where people aren't even able to come into the hospital for real surgeries and things, but may have horribly high pressure. You know, you're not putting an implant in and this is a, something you can feel comfortable about doing in, in more patients if you, if you make it more gentle. Thank you so much, Dr. Esponso. Um, Dr. Tart, um, any, any experience with CPC in good vision? Is this something um, yeah, I have been actually practicing CPC in, uh, in, in lots of patients that, of, of seeing eyes, and I agree with what Ahmed was saying. The, the potential for damage uh, is something that we, we uh, retain from our residency years when we are thinking of thesis bullby and all that. But to be very honest, it's something that is very rare to be seen now. We can titrate our, uh, our therapy and... Uh, and damage uh, resulting into catastrophic scenarios is something that is extremely low. Probably in, in our case, we, we could not see more than 1% in very extreme eyes, including neovascular glaucomas. So initially, about maybe 15 years ago, when we published the first edition of our book, we were citing 6%. But with the new technologies that are available now, I think that we, we should expect less than 1% uh, of of vision threatening complications with cyclophotocoagulation. And uh, Dr. Yasmin, do you see a role for um, cyclodestructive procedures in uh, childhood glaucomas? Yeah, absolutely. For, well, I've, been, I've had an experience with the diode cyclophotocoagulation and with the micropulse. Uh, the micropulse have been amazed by how quiet the eye is on the first day post-operatively and the study we published we reported that. And amazingly, the results have been very good uh, over the short term, 
at least uh, we need to look up the longer term results in our patients, in our subsets of patients, because we included a lot of patients that have had a lot of uh, cyclodiode sessions before. So these are the really refractory patients. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to give it a, a good chance and, and see how it works over the longer term. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Ahmed. Thanks, um, all our participants. And, uh, Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Dr. can I ask you a question, please? So, and ask the panel, yes. You know, with the primary treatment, when you have a patient with the primary open angel glaucoma, yes, uh, you have different types of lasers to treat so that you can start with micropulse, of course. And on the other hand, you can go for SLT. And there is a great push, you know, towards SLT. So that how to make such you know, a choice among these two types of lasers? Well, um, I belong to the, the, the minority um, who don't believe in SLT. And, um, you know, um, actually... You uh, make, you are going to make Rick <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, I was uh, practicing in Bascom Palmer, um, you know, uh, as an attending after I finished my fellowship, and then I moved to private practice. And now... Um, I see more patients, um, you know, that are um, like, you know, referred from other, like, you know, from comprehensive ophthalmologists and other um, uh, practices um, that have undergone uh, like seven, eight, ten um, SLTs, um, and then they refer them for something else. And uh, uh, it, it's just the evidence is very conflicting. So, um, like you know, there uh, I can't. Th there were two RCTs or like two two big studies in 2019. One that was actually, um, in, uh, I can't really remember where they come from. One of one from one of them were, was from the UK. Um, yeah, that's the light study. The light study. Right, and um, one suggested that it's actually, it works best or like it, it does better than um, medical treatment and the other suggested that it has less benefit. Now, in my hands, it really has a very low success rate. I don't know if it's my technique. I don't know if it's, uh, I really like, you know, don't offer it unless a patient really insists. Um, I would, uh, you know, I, you know, like putting a patient on prostaglandins is definitely something that I would do before offering any type of laser. That's like, you know, for a patient that is, you know, yeah. coming with a new diagnosis of glaucoma. Now, for patients that need an added drop or anything like that, well, this is probably my only narrow indication is like, you know, to weigh, to, to, to see if somebody is willing to try SLT prior to going to more invasive options when they are on maximally tolerated medical therapy. And um, the other thing is, if really a patient is, is progressing despite a pressure that is like, you know, in the mid-teens, I don't think that SLT will ever really lower the pressure from mid-teens to low-teens. It, it really doesn't. And um, I, I'm just not a big fan, to be honest. And, um, I, you know, the, yeah, then this this is this is a discussion that can go on for you know a couple of hours. If we continue on that because you you you'll have a lot of people that have different opinion on this panel. Uh, but I think we should go on with the meeting. Okay, so um, now Dr. Tarek, we come to you. Dr. Tarek is a key opinion leader in glaucoma surgery. Um, he's the chief of the glaucoma service in um, the University of Geneva. Um, he's uh, um, also the president of the International Society of Glaucoma Surgery, and uh, he has done such an amazing, um, like, you know, charitable work and community service um, in Egypt and in other countries as well, and has uh, lectured worldwide and uh, is, is um, very well um, respected and very well published. And, uh, you know, we're delighted and honored to have him today. Um, to speak about non-penetrating glaucoma surgery. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Tarek. Please go ahead. Muhammad, thank you very, very much for organizing uh, this meeting and for inviting us all. I think you're steering the meeting uh, to very interesting discussion. And uh, I thank you very much for, for, for organizing the whole thing. Uh, can you hear me? Absolutely, yes. Very good. Okay. So my talk is about non-penetrating glaucoma surgery and... Um, 
this is something that is very close to my heart. I have been working on uh, non penetrating glaucoma surgery for quite a while. I've shared a lot of, uh, of research work with, with my very uh, good friends and mentors and colleagues, including Rick Sponzel here and including Andre Mermou and, and many others uh, of my colleagues. Uh, why non penetrating glaucoma surgery? Because basically, it remains in my hands the safest and most efficacious procedure that is available. I have as you might know, I have uh, you know, dabbled in all types of non-penetrating glaucoma surgeries, in, in different types of tubes, in minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries, and I still have not found something that will surpass the results that I have in my hands with non-penetrating glaucoma surgery. So as you can see, I try start all types of glaucoma surgery uh, with good exposure. We have designed the speculum a few years ago, and uh, we use an 8O vicryl to hook the cornea intrastromal. We, we go do it about a bit diagonal and we move the globe to the direction that we want. It works very well for, for tubes as well and for being, uh, being able to move the globe into different directions. So you can see with what uh, you have a good space by which to uh, dissect. The second aspect of my, of my um, presentation when we're speaking about what is non penetrating surgery is to always remind you that it's an extraocular approach. You are not supposed to be inside the eye at any point of time. And remember that the whole concept is to work on the inner wall of Schlem's canal together with the juxtacanalicular trabeculum. Removing those two elements is actually removing the site of maximal obstruction in both primary and secondary open angle glaucoma. So basically you are focusing and, fo and, and targeting your uh, procedure to the site of the disease. And for me, this is something that, uh, that makes perfect sense. From there on, I'll go into a few slides very rapidly to show you what we're doing on an animation. What we do is to actually create a flap four by four millimeters of mercury, as you can see here. From there on, we do a deeper dissection to unravel the inner, the Schlem's canal, to bisect Schlem's canal, basically, and uh, followed by peeling of the inner wall of Schlem's canal and the juxtacanalicular trabeculum. And what is left is what we call the trabeculodesmets membrane, what is left of trabeculum, as well as the desmets membrane. And that's basically the procedure. Uh, I start my procedure always, always with a small snip in the conjunctiva and I do a hydrodissection. I mean, hydrodissection for me is something that is fundamentally important in all types of glaucoma surgery because not just uh, to balloon the conjunctiva, but mainly to be able to identify what kind of conjunctiva you're, you, you're, you're dealing with. Is it a thin conjunctiva? Is it, a, is it a atrophic conjunctiva? Is it a scarred conjunctiva? Because whatever you do, if you don't have a conjunctiva to cover your operation with, you are basically screwed. So if you can see, this is, for example, a case of, uh, you know, we're, we're doing a hydrodissection after a vitrectomy that was done many years ago. And you can see 360 degrees, more or less, around the limbus that the conjunctiva is absolutely scarred. There's no point in going for an, uh, you know, uh, uh, a deep sclerectomy or trabeculectomy here. For me, this is a clear indication to go for a tube. Now, whenever you are dissecting a flap, a mandatory step is to be able to put tension in the flap, pull the flap, because you have to be able always to see this, the edge of your knife. If the edge of the knife is not obvious, so it is covered by your flap, then basically what is happening is that you are unable to, to gauge and to make sure that you are dissecting in the same uh, depth all the time. Uh, not seeing what you're doing basically means that you are dissecting blindly, and that doesn't make any sense to me. Now, uh, very important as you go for the, for the deeper flap, Remember that as you go on the cornea, you are drawing, and as you go backwards, you are scratching, and then stop at the, at the angle, in, at, the, at one of the you know, angles posteriorly, and dissect deeply till you are able to find the, uh, 
the, the choroid. Look here, please. I'm using a number 11 blade, which I think is good enough. And from there on, I'm working in the angle. I'm not going more anteriorly. I'm really, really focused on this zone and dissecting deeper and deeper. You have to see the choroid. The best surgeons, if they do not see the choroid, they can make a mistake. After thousands of cases, I can't remember, I can't really count how many cases that I have done with deep sclerectomy, I always remind myself that, you know, if you do not see the choroid, you can mix up and you can end up not dissecting in the same place. And if you don't believe me, I'll show you a case that I, uh, well, let's, let's first see this. As you dissect uh, and go anteriorly, you have to observe the different colors of the scleral surface of the first bed and of the second bed, which is much darker. And it is basically darker because you are just above the choroid. As you advance anteriorly, and I use a, a micro crescent knife, as you can see here, uh, you, you would observe that the scleral fibers become more parallel, which means that we are just behind Schlem's canal. You dip your knife a little bit deeper and the Schlem's canal is, is open. As you can see here, we have a, 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 we are opening Schlem's canal from one side to the other. And aqueous starts to egress or percolate, and you can apply some pressure on the bed to be able to detach the decimates membrane from the overlying stroma. Nothing really, no rocket science here. You are basically following certain steps. So Schlem's canal, what is in front of you is what is left of trabeculum. Anterior to that, you have the decimates membrane. Now, if, if the decimates membrane and the stroma are not easily yielding to your pressure, you can always use a spatula, an atraumatic. This is a rounded spatula. We call it the vitreous spatula. And you basically go under the stroma and very gently detach the decimates membrane. Once you, you have created a recess under your decimates membrane, then it's the time for you to bring the number 11 blade. And the number 11 blade is basically a very clever knife in that situation because the blunt area would protect, protect the decimates membrane while the sharp area will help you to cut, uh, you know, upward and outwards to be able to actually, you know, uh, advance and, and enlarge what we call the trabeculum decimates window. Uh, once you have actually did, done a good dissection, now it's your job to peel the inner wall of Schlem's canal. There are different ways to do that. I use a special forceps that was, on, uh, that was designed by Andre Mermou. Uh, I think it's out of production now, so you can always use a good capsule rexus forceps, the, possibly something that is not too pointed and then you peel the inner wall of Schlem's canal. It's very elastic tissue. It will come out with you and it will contract once it comes out. And this has been analyzed many times by us and other groups to show that this is really the target tissue. What is left is, you know, aqueous egressing, as you can see here, uh, without penetrating the antechambers. So you can see the iris, but you're seeing the iris through the transparent decimates membrane. Nothing, I'm not obviously stroking the iris. And so you see decimates membrane, behind that you have iris tissue and posterior to that it is, is what left of the Schlem's canal. Now, just to show you the importance of dissecting till you see the choroid. This is a case where the dissection surgeon was very confident, you know, I have dissected, I know where I am, I don't need to go to, uh, to, to, to see the choroid. So let's continue to, to dissect anteriorly. Uh, Overconfidence is obviously a big problem with some surgeons. Uh, you have to remember that, that uh, perfection can be an enemy of excellence. Now, the surgeon here has dissected anteriorly, but he has completely missed Schlem's canal. So you can see that nothing is coming out. This is really still, you know, uh, uh, scleral tissue. And then anterior to that, you have corneal tissue. There is nothing here that is, that, is, that is similar morphologically to Schlem's canal. What can you do in a situation like that? Now, it's an interesting manu maneuver that you will see because basically what happened was to uh, attempt to create a third flap. 
when you can see here again with the number now remember that we're working at microns a really 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 small amount of 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 thickness under your under your knife so you have to be ultra sensitive as you as you go on and try to create a third flap something that you usually are not requested to do but anyway to make this shorter uh, the third flap is being created as you can see here and very very gently the new angle is being uh, you know identified and through that you can then again go deeper to see the choroid and from there advance uh, to be able to see Schlem's canal being opened, as you can see here. So you can salvage the operation even if you are dissecting too superficial. Just, just reminding you of that. But to avoid this mess, just dissect posteriorly in the right way and find your choroid. What is left is this UBM image of the iris, of the cornea, of the trabecular membrane, and of the intrascleral space or intrascleral bleb that you have created surgically, which is why the blebs after deep sclerectomy are rather uh, diffuse and shallow compared to a trabeculectomy one, simply because part of the filtration is happening intrasclerally. Now, a few words to say how I close my conjunctiva, nothing too complicated. I use a non-spatulated, this is a spatulated uh, needle, but I use a non-spatulated needle, an 8-O vicral, and the trick is to stretch significantly the conjunctiva to be able to actually uh, you know push it as much as possible on the on the limbus to avoid any sidle so first you know first stitch and from there on we continue uh, of continuous st stitching till you basically close the last stitch in itself and with this very simple way of closing i have to say that my the incidence of of, of sidle or even provoked sidles in my hands are not so significant. Uh, what happens if, you know, scarring starts and the patient is failing with the deep sclerectomies? Deep sclerectomies have a second life. They give you a strategic reserve that comes automatically with the procedure. If you feel that the filtration is not good enough, you can do, as you can see here, what we call agoniopuncture. So you focus on the trabeculodesmus membrane towards the cornea and not towards the iris. And from there on, very limited energy, we are throwing a few spots of laser on the, um, on the trabeculodesmus membrane to create micro perforations. And that is in 15 minutes after that, in the vast majority of cases, you have the pressure going down. This is basically the work of uh, one of my ex-fellows. And you can see uh, this is four years after the operation. No goniopuncture done. We do the goniopuncture 15 minutes later. Pressure goes down. Intrascleral space is formed. And this is four months or three months post-goniopuncture. Still a good amount of filtration and pressure is well controlled. So, And we have really hundreds of, of those examples. This is not anecdotal, but this is really what happens after a goniopuncture. Now, don't be trigger happy with, the, with your YAG laser. Don't try to demolish the trabecular desmet's membrane. Otherwise, unfortunately, the iris can jump inside the intraspheral space, something that is rare to happen. But what, once it happens, you have the pupil becoming, you know, uh, uh, vertical, verticalized pupil. And with a goniopuncture, with a gonioscopy, you can easily see that the iris has jumped inside. And most of those cases I have managed surgically, unfortunately. So I go in, I inject, you know, something to, you know, a meiotic uh, uh, molecule inside. And then with a spatula under viscoelastic, I would reposition the iris. And usually in the vast majority of my cases, I have not uh, met with a second uh, you know, a second uh, leap of faith of the iris jumping into the intrascleral space one more time. So with that, I try to be as uh, pragmatic, as, uh, you know, as, as specific as possible, step-by-step -step procedure. Uh, I know that we might not have uh, hours and hours to discuss this procedure, but if anybody wants to discuss later on through email uh, or through a WhatsApp or whatever, if you'd like to send questions regarding efficacy, regarding complications, whatever, um, I'll be more than, uh, I'll be more than uh, happy to help and to answer. And once again, 
uh, I, I thank Muhammad for, for hosting this and I thank you for being with us and uh, I hope that we soon can meet in, in, in real meetings where we can hopefully again shake hands. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tare. This was an incredible presentation and uh, you know, thank you so much for sharing this elegant technique, um, which like, you know, unfortunately I don't do, but certainly we'll, we'll reach out to you so that you can give me some more uh, tips and tricks um, to start. Um, any questions um, from our presenters? Yeah, I, I um, think that was a fabulous talk and I loved watching the videos uh, with that great narration. <clears throat> um, this business of um, the occasional iris incarceration after goniopuncture, we've encountered as well. Uh, and uh, I, I basically at the slit lamp can fix that. If, if you just put some myostat on a 30 gauge needle, a TB syringe and uh, bend the needle and use it as a little tool, uh, you can capture the iris up uh, at 12 o'clock and just dial down as you inject and the pupil gets small fast and you it disincarcerate it. And then to avoid it happening again, I just walk them over to the argon laser and I stiffen up the peripheral iris at the top, which then makes it peak a little bit, but it won't get stuck again. Um, yeah. and you Rick, I, 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 I totally see your point and I, um, I, I you know, I respect it completely. Um, my two cents on that is I don't even do needlings on slit lamp. You might think of it as, uh, as too conservative, but uh, I have the capacity in Geneva to take the patient to the operating room and fix it in an operating room. I feel more comfortable, you know, under the microscope. It's, but you agree with me, whatever makes the surgeon comfortable with that. I like, I like to be in control and I feel more in control in the operating room than actually uh, doing that on the slit lamp. Though I know uh, and respect your experience with that. And I think uh, what you always do on the slit lamp has always, has not been anything short of magic. <laughs> uh, 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 Dr. Mohammed, can I have uh, just a comment? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Tari, thank you very much. That's really wonderful. Uh, I like the videos and everything. So that I have been doing deep sclerectomies for like 15 years uh, r uh, right now. And um, the point uh, is that uh, some people uh, think that deep sclerectomy is not suitable for patients with advanced glaucoma. So do you agree with me, Tariq, that it should be the best option for patients with uh, advanced glaucoma due to the obvious it, uh, advantages? It is. Yeah, I, 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 I cannot agree more. Uh, for advanced glaucoma, basically, you have very little room for maneuver and you have very little tolerance for complications. Obviously, okay. deep sclerectomy is the operation with the least potential for complication. For that reason, it, it is really an ideal operation. I mean, imagine a high myope patient, single-eyed, with an advanced glaucoma. Doing trabeculectomy there is, is, hell, is, yeah, is, is yeah, it's, it's very, very, uh, you know, close to committing uh, suicide for the surgeon. Yeah, yeah. I, I would sleep much better doing a deep sclerectomy and I would feel that I have served my patient much better by not opening the anti chamber uh, in a case like that. So to be honest, and in, in one sentence, best indications for deep sclerectomy are very early cases and very advanced cases and probably all cases of open angle glaucoma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I totally agree with that, yeah. Uh, I, I, it's transformed my world because uh, I get sent lots of patients who are already blind in one eye and had a bad outcome with somebody else's trabeculectomy. And a lot of them are uveitic or even secondary glaucomas with trauma and things. You know, and they, these obviously are not ideal candidates. But again, if you use a laser ahead of time, if they get a narrow angle and you're worried about iris incarceration, you, you just do a preliminary argon uh, peripheral iridoplasty at 12 o'clock and just make a little extra space. And then you won't have to worry about that uh, down the line. So, uh, you know, we published in 2013 the success rate, we had significant improvement in visual function. And I, I think people should be publishing their visual field data. And why don't they? Well, because 
there's a lot of fallout. You know, you can bring someone's pressure down and you can give them hypotony or you can bring their pressure down and you can wreck their cornea or give them a cataract or whatever, you know, give them maculopathy because of hypotony. Well, the great thing about this operation is it gives you very reliable outcomes. And the pressures typically are somewhere between seven and 13, you know, and that's it. And I use mitomycin. You, I notice most people don't, but I have a lot of African-American patients. And, um, you know, I, I, but I use the same thing on the old ladies who are white. I, I, everybody gets mitomycin 0.4, uh, you know, three little applications. And we get fabulous pressure control. I mean, and their lives are transformed. And many of them have been through hell. <laughs> and they, you know, and we're the last, the best. So, yes, uh, if you read the textbook, well, you're supposed to work on an eye that has a perfect angle and it's, you know, a nice clean open angle. This operation is a salvation for people. If, you, if you're prepared to do little extra things to try to make sure they all succeed, uh, the, you know, the bleb husbandry is much easier. It's a much more sessile bleb. It's not going to hang over the cornea. It's the best thing I've ever learned in my entire career. And it was a result of going to a ski race meeting with Elk <laughs> and staying an extra day or two in the Lausanne Geneva area and making great friends, the best friends of my life in, in my career. So uh, I, I can't say enough about this. We've got another five year follow up study that's just going into press. Um, and the results are just spectacular with this operation. And there's I, no way. You, yeah. Carry on. Yeah, Rick, I, 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 uh, I, well, I agree with everything that you said, obviously, but uh, in, I, I'll say, even venture to say something that is relatively unorthodox. Even when I'm stuck with a very high risk case of, uh, you know, chronic anger closure glaucoma, and if I can see that the upper, you know, 180 degrees is devoid of, of cyanike, I would follow what you were saying. I'll do iridoplasty and do non-penetrating surgery. That's obviously not something that is an indication that, that I'm propagating too much, but, but this is in my hands when I'm stuck and I don't have a potential to accept any complication. That's exactly what I'm doing, even in current angle closure glaucomas. Yeah, in a so lot of our patients, the operative uh, orders define precisely what clock hours I'm going to work in because they have Sonechia. So I'll say, well, this one has to go between 12.30 and 1.30. This exactly, one has to go. exactly. And you have to get that in the and in big red letters so that when they come through the operating room, yeah, that cannot be overlooked. You don't want to cut straight into a Sonechia or you're going to have a problem. But, mm -hmm. but I believe this operation is the best operation ever devised for this problem. Um, you know, as a primary procedure, it's a conservative thing to do. Your odds of getting hypotony, maculopathy, uh, or getting a bleb leak, any of these things are way lower. You know, and, and we, I went 14 years without a bleb leak with this thing. <laughs> you, I, I do a different closure because if you use anometabolite, I don't think you should do a fornix based flap. Uh, but in European, in Caucasian people, you can do as you just saw. But uh, I go way back and do a uh, limbus based flap uh, with a very posterior incision right over the belly of the uh, superior rectus muscle and do the big dissection down and keep the limbal conjunctiva intact. Uh, and, and, you know, like I said, I went, I literally went 14 years without a bleb leak, uh, which is the most common post operative complication after trabeculectomy. So, and I do a double layer closure that was taught to me by George Spaeth and uh, Lou Cantor, which is a beautiful, you know, and, and I used um, the tapered ADO vicryl on a BV needle. Um, you know, it's more expensive and, and I get to use the original uh, Mermud uh, instruments. I still have a few sets of the ruby knife and the diamond blades and the lovely uh, Mermud forceps. But as you said, um, a nice pair of capsular rectus forceps actually has the same tips for peeling out the external trabeculum. Absolutely, absolutely. But it, it's a, it's, yeah. it makes you feel so good to do this operation. This is everyone who watches admires what's going on. Anyway, enough of that. I just wanted to share my enthusiasm. <laughs> make more of you go for this operation. This is, in my opinion, unquestionably the superior procedure for uh, filtration. Excellent. Yeah. Sorry, one I more think comment, we're... you know that. Yes. You know that in, in our region, we have lots of Jovenite open angle glaucomas. So 
So that's between the age of, you know, that 18 and 40. And, I, and they present with advanced disease. And I still believe it's the best option for them as well. Uh, I agree, Ahmed. And, and I've been very fortunate to be able to operate on a good number of primary open angle, juvenile primary open angle cases from the Middle East. I've also had the opportunity and the honor to operate on many cases post LASIK. So those are steroid induced glaucomas in young people with crystal clear corneas and crystal clear uh, lenses. And those are not cases for trabeculectomy. And our results, yeah. we, have, we have a 10 year follow up of a group of 30 patients of juvenile primary open and of, uh, of post LASIK. We pooled them because of age. And the results are yeah. spectacular. In, in, in some of those cases, and I'm quite cautious as I say that, but I have the evidence. We had, we had cases that had actually in the bad eye a dropped vision because of, of inclusion on, on, on fixation. And once you do the operation and reduce the pressure, just like Rick was saying, you actually improve central vision, not just yeah. visual field. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, this is the only incisional procedure for which there is clear clinical evidence for statistically significant improvement in visual function postoperatively. And, you know, it's, you must try. Uh, I loved watching your film because our techniques differ. I, I'm kind of like a dinosaur doing it the first way that I was shown <laughs> by uh, uh, your uh, colleague and mine, Andre Mermud. Uh, that those years ago, and and it's like watching, you know, uh, I, I, I love that little micro instrument. I'm, I'm gonna have to try that technique. It, it, there's some beautiful new things I learned today. Uh, I, I just love it, and it, and I'm going to be uh, trying to figure out where to order those tools from you. Uh, um, actually, I have one quick question to uh, Dr. Yasmin. So, uh, do you combine it with ab external trabeculotomy in um, some Please children? Correct me. Please correct me. I think we all share the enthusiasm for stem canal procedure, no matter what we choose from the armamentarium. So what I'm comfortable doing and I really uh, like is the external trabeculotomy circumferentially or the GAT. Uh, I've always been thinking of combining it with the hysterectomy, but for, at this point in time, I haven't, uh, I mean, attempted What it. would make you consider um, to combine it rather than just have a standalone stem canal-based surgery? Well, at least theoretically, the advantage would be the ability to convert it into a full thickness, uh, into a trabeculectomy later on if, if the, the internal filtration at the level of stem canal is not functioning well. So that might be the incentive. But at this point in time, I'm happy doing the circumferential incision circumferentially because I'm worried if you combine both together, you might end up with some, albeit being on the hypotenuse side if you're doing too much. Um, but it is definitely one of the options, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Dr. Tarek. Amazing, amazing uh, procedure. So um, I think it's my turn. So um, I'm going to share my screen and okay. So um, I have no financial disclosures, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, glaucoma drainage devices um, and the management of glaucoma. Um, so um, glaucoma drainage devices um, are being increasingly utilized in the surgical management of glaucoma. So if we look at this graph, we see that uh, between 1994 and 2010, um, and this data is like 10 years old, um, there has been a steady decline in the number of trabeculectomies that have been performed in the United States. Um, this is likely attributed to advances in medical therapy as prostaglandins had been introduced around the mid to late 1990s. But what's interesting here is that during the same time period, the number of tube shunts um, that had been placed in the United States had been steadily growing. Um, but we should point out here that the vertical axes on that graph are different. Um, so, if, you know, if we look carefully, 
trabeculectomy continues to be a much more commonly performed operation um, than tube shunt surgery. Um, maybe less so today. Again, th this data is um, 10 years old, but um, you know, I think is true um, until today. But this shift in the practice patterns in glaucoma surgery is um, very obvious. Um, I took this slide from uh, my mentor, Dr. Steve Getty, who um, himself took it from uh, Dr. Rich. Um, so um, there is, um, you know, the history behind tube shunts. Like in 1906, they uh, placed um, a, a horse hair um, across the anterior chamber to allow some minute amount of continued um, uh, aqueous um, egress. And, um, you know, uh, they did a procedure called aqueoplasty in 1912, but it wasn't until 1968 when uh, modern uh, glaucoma drainage implants had been introduced by Dr. Maltino, with the Maltino implant that we all know. So um, a tube shunt is really consists of um, two components, a tube and a plate. Um, so the, the function of the tube is to really shunt the aqueous from the anterior chamber to where the plate is. And um, it also maintains the, the sclerostomy fistula patent. Um, the end plate, um, on the other hand, is located in the equatorial area of the globe and um, forms a capsule because the body recognizes there is a foreign object that had been placed. So uh, the patient's own um, defense mechanisms kind of um, like, you know, start to lay down some fibrous tissue, uh, which would form a capsule around the end plate. And this is very crucial in minimizing how much um, aqueous egress is out of the eye because um, um, you know, we don't want, the only thing that is worse than high pressure is low pressure, as we all know. Um, there has been, um, you know, however, a number of studies that suggest that enlarging the plate size, like, you know, the plate size, like, you know, the, the theory says the bigger you go, the more eff effective your pressure lowering is. But there have been a number of studies that suggest that enlarging the plate size and therefore the surface area of the capsule beyond a certain maximum may not really um, translate into better outcomes in terms of uh, pressure lowering. So actually in my hands, the 250 implants, the Barvelt or now the ClearPath, the 250 implants offer um, similar pressure reduction to the 350 implants. Um, which has been demonstrated again um, in, in um, several studies. So traditionally, glaucoma drainage implants have been reserved for, um, you know, advanced diseases or like, you know, cases of failed trabeculectomy, um, perilimbal scarring, which would make the trabeculectomy impossible. Um, neovascular glaucoma, uveitic glaucoma, again, those are tough glaucomas to treat uh, or operate on. Um, epithelial or fibrous downgrowth, which would um, doom the trabeculectomy and make it fail immediately. Um, cases of uh, childhood glaucoma that fail um, angle surgery and trabeculectomy. And in cases of aphakia, where patients need to wear a contact lens and like, you know, an overhanging blab. Um, may actually make the um, uh, wearing consequences impossible. So um, the implant, um, there are several types of implants. Um, they are they come in different sizes, different shapes, different um, materials that they that they are manufactured from. But most importantly, their mechanism of action, whether they are valved or non-valved implants. So um, the non-valved implants, um, you know, again, the Multino um, was the first to be introduced, um, has gone several stages of evolution. Um, the Barville tube, the most commonly used nowadays, uh, and most recently the Ahmed clear path. 
Um, the uh, Barveld and the ClearPath both come in two sizes, the 250 and the 350 uh, millimeter, um, square millimeter surface area of the um, end plate. So um, when we implant a non-valve tube, you know, we restrict the flow through the tube for the first five or six weeks until you know, the body is really, um, has formed a protective capsule around that plate, uh, which would um, limit how much fluid goes out of the eye. So it, a lot of like residents and um, young ophthalmologists do not know whether a tube is open or not. Um, and, you know, it, it's really like, if this is for example, a barbell tube, a superior temporal barbell. And um, if you ask the patient, this is a spear temporal tube, you ask them to look down and in, and we see a ridge. And behind that ridge, there is kind of a depression. And this is um, like really when um, the tube has not really opened yet. But when the tube opens, like, you know, we, we no longer see that ridge and we see that like big bleb in, in, in most cases. Um, now, um, the valved implants, on the other hand, um, like the most commonly used is the FP7 Ahmed implant. And if, if you look at the surface area, it's much smaller than um, even the smaller bar belt or clear pass. So it's 184 uh, millimeter, square millimeters um, of surface area. So the surgical techniques. So just like Dr. Tarek does, I like to uh, place a traction suture. I use 7O Vicro um, um, on double arm, double arm um, 7 Vicro. Um, make the conjunctival incision, um, have very good exposure. In case of a valved implant like an amid, we should prime it. What if we don't prime the implant? Well, if we don't prime a valve implant, what happens is primary failure. It will never work. And like most cases of valve implants, we leave a, um, um, you know, some viscoelastic, most surgeons leave some viscoelastic in the eye. Um, and if the implant is not really um, primed, pri you know, prior to implantation, next day post-op, um, you know, the pressure is going to be in the 50s and 60s. Um, and after we prime the valve, if it's valved, you know, in either case, we attach it to the sclera. I use 80 nylon sutures. Um, um, in non valved implants, we restrict the flow uh, either with a rip cord together with a ligature or a ligature alone. I use a 7 0 lig ligature by itself. Then we insert the tube in the eye. Um, you know, we make sure the tube is well covered either with the patient's own sclera um, or a patch graft or both. And then we close the conjunctival. So um, again, I place a 7-0 double-armed uh, vicryl suture and uh, I actually put it on a locking needle holder um, and use it to um, you know, move the, the, the eye around and improve my exposure. Um, and usually the assistant gives me um, the um, exposure. Now, um, the most common way of um, like making the incision is um, perilimbo pyridomy. Um, you know, of course, the bigger your uh, pyridomy is, the easier um, your surgery is going to be, but also, um, you know, conjunctival is very precious in glaucoma surgery. So, um, you know, the, there is a trade-off here. Um, and then this is an AMID implant, for example, and I'm not sure if this uh, picture is clear, but we see that um, here we're priming it. This is the, the, the flow. I think we have a video. Yes, we do. Um, so here I'm priming the AMID um, using 27 gauge uh, um, cannula on DSS, and we're gonna see the stream of fluid right now. Here it is. Okay, that's it, it's primed. Um, 
Now, these are the barbell tubes. So they, are, they can be really inserted under the muscle or uh, above the muscle, but they are preferably inserted under the muscle with the help of one or two muscle hooks. Um, the plate is, is then sutured to the sclera using ato nylon or pruning suture, and the knots uh, are rotated into the eyelids to prevent sticking through the conjunctiva. Um, you know, again, I use a 7-0 ligature um, tied around the tube to restrict the flow. Uh, the tube is then tested for water tightness to ensure complete um, impotency. Uh, a 4-0 proline or 4-0 nylon suture um, sometimes is um, used as a ripcord to aid in restricting the flow. I generally avoid ripcord sutures except in certain situations. Um, the tube can be uh, fenestrated proximal to the ligature site. Uh, which can offer some level of IOP control for the initial post-op period before the tube opens. Um, other techniques um, can be utilized, uh, such as, uh, you know, you can do a simultaneous or trabeculectomy, um, which is a non-augmented trabeculectomy, which is doomed to fail uh, by the time that the tube opens. Um, again, so this is uh, how I really tie my tube um, so a 7 a, 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 a segment of 7 Vicro that, um, you know, I tie with three throws. I make sure that, um, you know, my, my uh, knot is flat um, and I use a pair of, uh, two pairs of uh, needle holders to pull on them. Then I, uh, you know, after putting a couple more throws, I create an, an air column in the tube and then um, I inject balanced salt solution in the um, tube. And um, it's not very obvious in the video, uh, but really uh, you should see the bubble of air moving and um, you shouldn't have any fluid uh, coming from the plate side. And this ensures the, the, the impotency of the tube. Um, so uh, now we insert the tube in the eye. The globe is uh, rotated backwards into primary position and um, is laid flat on the cornea. And, um, uh, you know, we cut the tube to appropriate length with the bevel, with the bevel away from the iris. And then using a 23 gauge bent needle, um, you know, we enter the anterior chamber about two or so millimeters uh, posterior to the limbus. And the entry is made parallel to the iris. So um, this, you know, the, the needle track can, um, you know, should actually follow the tube curvature. Um, and then, you know, you can use a scleral groove uh, with a 69 beaver blade prior to, um, you know, like the, the needle track um, or tunnel construction. Um, and then uh, we thread the tube into the anterior chamber. And of course, um, minor modifications are done if the tube is to be inserted into the ciliary sulcus and pseudophagic eyes, um, which can actually uh, improve the uh, endothelial cell function, um, or I mean endothelial cell survival, um, and minimize endothelial cell loss, um, at least theoretically. Um, Again, this is um, how I used to do all of my tubes. So um, I now really um, don't do the, the, the groove anymore, but this is a 69 beaver, about two millimeters. I make a, a like, you know, a, a small um, a groove and then um, using a 23 gauge bent needle. So if we see here, I'm holding the traction suture in my right hand, and this is a left eye, so I'm, I'm in the superior temporal quadrant. Um, the, to, the needle, uh, I'm holding the, the eye in my right hand using the traction suture, and then the needle is gonna make the needle track and the, the, the anterior chamber entry, but I'm using my right hand as a lever, really, to change the direction of the globe and change the direction of the needle as well so that when I enter the eye, it's absolutely parallel to the eye. Um, this is how I make my, so that you stay away really from the corneal endothelium. This is how I make my, my entry into the AC. Again, I changed the direction, see how high the, that knee is right now and I entered parallel to the iris, and now I just insert the tube. Mm. 
Now, like in intro nasal tubes, um, you know, there is not enough um, coverage um, with the eyelids. So really the, the, the rates of exposure are really higher. So this is the technique that I really like if I don't have too many cases and I have enough time in my list. Um, so that's what I like to do in, um, in an infranasal tube. So I make a long um, scleral tunnel. So I use a micro crescent knife to make two parallel grooves, one about two millimeters and the other about like, you know, six or seven millimeters posteriorly. And then um, I, I dissect between the two um, uh, vertical grooves and I'm using the micro crescent knife. And then I bring the 23 gauge needle and through the, the more proximal um, groove, I, I make my needle track, I enter into the anterior chamber, and then I will actually um, tuck the tube into the scleral tunnel, and I will use on top of that a patch graft. So it's very difficult for the tube to actually um, get exposed um, with, uh, you know, having been covered by both the patient's own sclera and a patch graft. So, um, you know, I'm gonna skip here. So the, then we put the patch graft. This is a half moon uh, cornea patch graft. Many patch graft materials exist. The most commonly uh, um, used ones are the half moon uh, grafts or the sclera or the pericardium patch grafts. Most recently, the umbilical cord amniotic membrane composite patch grafts were developed and showed uh, non-inferiority, which we, my, our group published on. Um, the patch, um, in, you know, in most of the cases, secure to the sclera using interrupted 7 micro. Um, and then we close the conjunctiva. I'm not gonna go into the details of closing, but, uh, you know, pretty standard. Um, then we make a temporal paracentesis. Typically, if it's a non-valve tube, and, and I don't have a shallow chamber or anything, I just leave it as is. Now, if it is a valve tube, um, you know, I like to overfill the AC with, um, you know, helon uh, to avoid uh, postoperative hypotony. So this is a Barville tube, superior temporally. This is an Ahmed FP7 infro um, nasally. Um, now, I, I've been, since I uh, started doing the, the clear pass, I've been really um, doing this micro incision um, technique, which I uh, find quite neat and um, very useful. So um, I mark four millimeters uh, posterior to the limbus, as well as four millimeter, um, you know, incision. And uh, So I fold the tube, um, the shunt after I actually secure it uh, with a 7-0 micro ligature. I, actually, it comes with a pre-placed ripcord suture, which I really like to take out um, every time. Um, I'm taking out the uh, ripcord suture, making sure that, um, you know, I tie it quite well. And I don't know how to actually... Um, yeah, I'm just going to show you the, um, how I, um, I insert the, the shunt, then we can move forward. Testing the tube. I fold it like a taco or maybe like a, a burrito and um, insert it through the uh, small incision, and then I use a uh, sclera patch graft, which I don't have to suture. Here is the burrito. It goes in, it's very flexible, it conforms to the globe curvature, and it's in. Now, what are the complications? Um, you can have an improper direction of the needle track in the surgery. So redirect it, make a new needle track site. You can cause a scleral perforation, um, renal priapexy if needed. 
myphema. You may need to irrigate the AC. These are all intraoperative complications. This is pretty significant hyphema that should really be, uh, you know, washed out in surgery. Maybe you should leave some heline um, to tampon on it. Um, the early postoperative complications, hypotony, um, you know, if it's mild, just reform of viscoelastic or um, take back to the uh, OR and ligate the tube or uh, put in a proline plug, which um, I'll show you a case of um, shortly. Uh, tube obstruction, um, you can put uh, out to place, um, tissue plasminogen activator injected in, uh, intracamerally, or if there is a vitreous strand, you may yag it. Um, or lastly, do an anterior vitrectomy if there is a, a vitreous strand. In hypertensive phases, which happen at about three or four weeks after you put the tube, use aqueous suppressants and keep your fingers crossed. Uh, now, um, this is a case um, that I had that, you know, with failed encapsulation. Um, so failed encapsulation happens when, like, you know, in the initial six weeks, there is actually no um, uh, choroidals. There is no low pressure. And you're hoping that during these six weeks, until the ligature, um, you know, opens on its own, that um, a, a capsule would form. But if, if there is failed encapsulation of the end plate, this is what's going to happen, low pressure on choroidals. So after like, you know, many unsuccessful attempts to like, you know, helon injection, the AC, um, I took the patient back into the OR and um, intracamerally, I plugged the tube with a 2.0 proline. Um, this actually just abolishes all uh, flow through the tube. You can use a 4.0 proline and it would restrict it, but not completely abolish it. And uh, result, the choroidals were resolved. Um, I had to do a CPC later. Um, hypertensive phase again at three to four weeks. Um, this is um, like, you know, a, a lot of reaction, um, you know, inflammatory reaction, the anterior chamber clogging the tube after the tube had opened. And this is after um, TPA had been injected. Beautiful. Uh, this is actually uh, from Dr. C. Getty as well. Um, tube, uh, yeah, the late complications, tube, tube erosion. So with tube erosion, this is something that a lot of people don't know. So you cannot just place a patch graft over it and, 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 and just hope it works again. The microenvironment itself has to change. You need to move the tube away from um, the site where it actually um, eroded uh, or got exposed. Corneal edema, reposition the tube away, like put it in the, um, you know, um, sulcus or maybe in the uh, vitreous cavity after a, a, a vitreous shave. Um, diplopia, prisms don't usually work. Um, muscle surgery, remove the implant, have to do it twice. Um, again, this is a tube erosion in, in, a, in a very uh, difficult case of, uh, uh, you know, this is actually a superior nasal amid that I put in. And uh, this is a patient who, ha who has severe um, ocular surface disease, um, had Graves uh, ophthalmopathy, had a lot of orbital surgery, uh, and, um, you know, also uh, lateral tersorphy that the oculoplastic surgeon was not comfortable cutting. Um, so it was a very difficult surgery. Um, I'm not gonna show the video, but um, you know, you redirect the tube away. This is a tube refraction. There was not enough length. So I put a tube extender and a patch graft and you close. Um, I'm not gonna show the video. Um, so how to get the best out of them, uh, choose your patients. I pretty much use it in all cases. Um, Spare your patient the lifelong risk of endophthalmitis from trabeculectomy. Uh, my go-to procedure is uh, the Barville 250 non-valved implant. Now I use the uh, clear path more often. And, um, you know, it's, it's very convenient. Um, the more you do, the better the outcomes will be. Um, it's fine like an old wine, like, like uh, Dr. Palmberg says. Um, Stay away from trouble, ensure water tightness of the tube before uh, insertion. The longer the sclerotunnel, the less likely the exposure. Use your patch grafts. Uh, avoid curving the tube if you plan fenestrations because curving can actually 
pull, pull the, the opening too big and can cause hypotony. Um, the farther the tube from the cornea, the, the gentler on the endothelium, ensure adequate um, conjunctival closure, and uh, watch a lot of videos. Um, thank you so much. Um, give me a second to stop share. Okay, any questions? Okay. Uh, Dr. Mohamed, very nice presentation. Thank you for this nice speak. Uh, just I want to ask you in uh, pediatric glaucoma, if you are going to do uh, a valve or a tube surgery for the patient, uh, how to avoid the tube retraction in pediatric uh, glaucoma? Um, I don't really modify my technique much. If you leave um, enough, um, you know, with pediatric glaucoma that need the tube, really the, the globe is big anyway. So it's not like, you know, uh, you're, you're going to endlessly increase your globe size. But um, um, yeah, I, it, it, it really isn't a, an issue in my practice, um, you know, tube refraction in those particular cases. Um, so um, let's move forward. Right now we're going to have uh, Dr. Sponsel talk about his tube um, in, in cases of failed uh, you know, primary tube. Okay, and um, I will actually address that last comment. Um, I put the, if I have a neonate, somebody with a small eye, the baby, uh, I'll put the tube in at a kind of oblique angle with a little extra tube in the anterior chamber. Because some children, as they do grow and the eye does expand, uh, will uh, end up with the, the tube in the angle and ultimately obstructed. So, uh, and, and you can still keep it on the iris plane, you know, and avoid uh, corneal issues. Uh, clearly, as the eye does grow, you, you have a bigger chance uh, as that tube is retracting back to touch the endothelium. So you, you almost really want to burrow those things into the iris in the babies. Uh, that, I thought that was a great question. So I just didn't want that to be overlooked. Sure. Uh, and I thought it was a fabulous talk, a really good coverage of a lot of different tubes and an incredibly good introduction for what I'm about to talk about, uh, if I'm lucky enough to be able to get it up on the screen for us. So I'll, I'll have a go here, let's see. Uh, we're gonna talk about a new idea. Can you see me here? Everybody yes, ready to go? Can, but you can actually click on um, share screen. So if you click yeah, on oh, share screen. Okay, wait, I have to do that. Okay, hang on a second. I have to uh, escape, I guess. Give me a second. Um, there we go. Now I need to, oops, are you still there? Yes, we are. Good. Hallelujah. I thought I escaped from the Zoom. That would have been bad. Uh, I'm going to do share screen. How's that? Now you should see all sorts of funny stuff. Uh, um, no, you should choose which uh, of, of your screens or like your open windows that you want to um, share with us so uh, we okay. haven't really seen any yet okay well give me um how do you choose it i mean i'm uh um, so I'm on the side show and if i say play from the stars my screen is covered with this picture of the screen but you can you not see that let's see no um no you just opened the presentation first so open, open the presentation, the presentation on, the, on the powerpoint yeah yeah, it's open and my screen is full it's of open. the presentation. Yeah, um, share your screen, you, you will click on the, on the presentation itself. Yeah. You will select from the screen the presentation. And okay. then you will find the, uh, an icon to the right side down on the right, uh, share. I see it. Okay, are we good? Yeah. Yes, Excellent. yes we are. Perfect. Okay, well, starting out a funny place well into the talk, but it actually is a very good place to start and I'll back up to the beginning in a minute. Look carefully at these histological hematoxyl and eosin stain slides and realize that they come from behind the eyeball of rabbits. And our friend Dr. Ayala 
uh, who's a, a great guy. He's on one of the competing shows apparently at the moment. Um, in New Orleans and all his fellows uh, used our new tube shunt system uh, and compared traditional tube shunts to the new retro ball bar shunt. And you'll see the dark stain is showing you where there are micro cannuliculi forming between fat cells in the retro ball bar space. And that is actually the essence of what we're going to be talking about today. The idea of getting rid of the bleb. You don't need a bleb. You can create a lymphatic pathway between your fenestrated tube and the lining of the orbit, the periorbita, the periosteum of the orbit, which is amphiphilic and likes water. So this crazy idea of sticking fluid into a hydrophobic space, which is 99.9% .9 occupied by lipid and blood vessels and a few other things of importance like the optic nerve and so on. Um, this, this area um, is not a water-friendly environment, but believe it or not, all over our bodies, if you push water into a place that's not water friendly, it'll find its way around through the space between the cells. And that's what we discovered. Uh, it gets us away from all this worry about the uh, encapsulation of blebs. The uh, subconjunctival space, the subtenon space is very uh, hydrophilic, it's at least amphiphilic. And, and this is a nice place for fibroblasts to pro proliferate and create scarring. But back here behind the eyeball, there's no room for such behavior. Can you all see that? Are, is everybody hearing me? Are, are we on board? So I have to get to the point where I can now show the actual slideshow. But since we were on that slide, I thought that was a nice, interesting thing to look at. Did you see that picture? So here's my introductory yes, slide. And um, I want you to realize that I am a co-patentee with Dr. Ahmed. Mateen Ahmed of the Ahmed Valve, not our friend with this flowing, beautiful hair from Canada, who's a, a quite clever, another clever Ahmed. But Mateen, uh, who developed the FP7 and the Ahmed S2 valves and FP8 and all the others, uh, is, is a co-patentee with me on this because he helped make all the prototypes in the initial phase. So we have here um, there with Dr. Ayala and Dr. Groth, who's one of our people on the uh, advisory committee of the ISGS. Uh, the first paper that came out sometime back in 2014 showing one of these prototypes. And you'll see that this was a big fat thing that uh, I used to stick in the back of encapsulated blebs. So I started out by having a patient at the VA hospital who was blind in one eye and it had surgeries in all four quadrants of the other. And he was walking around with a white stick and he needed a corneal transplant, uh, but his pressure was 60, even though he was on Diamox. And um, I looked at this guy in the operating room and I thought, what the heck can I do with this? And I, I fished around through the retina cabinet and I found this number 70 retina tube that's used to chop up to make scleral buckles. So I got a, a Kelly punch and I made a bunch of holes in the tube and I stuck the thing in this guy. And 20 years later, he can see and he has corneal transplant and he's alive and well and doesn't need a white stick. Uh, and, and everything else that had been tried on him, including all medications, including oral medications had not succeeded. And my gift was that God left me the superior temporal quadrant with a huge, uh, encapsulated blab into which I shoved this thing in the back and uh, I, I shoved the back end into the retrobulbar space and saw what happened. The next day his pressure was 11. And so since then, I told Dr. Ahmed about this at, at two or three consecutive ARVO and AJO meetings and uh, AAO meetings. And he said, uh, Rick, you cannot patent a tube with some holes in it. Um, you're going to have to do better than that. Well, then I had some guy who was a federal judge in the United States who only had one eye and congenital glaucoma. And he had failed labs over the, all over the place other people had done. And so 
I stuck one of these things in the back of his eye and his pressure came down to 11 and he did quite well. But his coiled up in the blab. It, can't, it migrated anteriorly because the proline suture I put in to fixate it to the blab uh, broke. And I thought, oh my gosh, thank God it didn't go backwards because this guy's a lawyer, you know. Um, well, it all ends up that uh, I showed that to Dr. Ahmed and he said, oh, now necessity is the mother of invention. We need to do something to make this thing so it won't migrate in an anterior posterior direction. So the thing you see on the bottom left of this picture is from the paper, shows this locking device where you put it in through the blab element and, and then you suture to the sclera with those two little eyelets and the big fat uh, holes in this very big tube. Uh, as you can see to the right, how it fits in to an Ahmed uh, FP7. Uh, it, it, it's gigantic. It's much, much bigger in diameter than the tubing of a normal Ahmed. So that is called the B2B, the back to the, the bleb to the back. Well, we run studies on this, and as you can see, uh, they were only put into people who completely failed with either their Ahmed or their Bearbelt valves. And the control of IOP, as you can notice over a considerable period of time, is very good for a good number of patients who had these B2B things stuck in. And this is just the uh, rabbit study I referred to earlier that shows if you put into one eye a regular Ahmed tube shunt, and then in the other eye you put one of these things that's modified to have the big fat tube going to the retrobulbar space, the intraocular pressure ends up actually lower in the eye of this normal rabbit uh, uh, than you would have expected. Uh, so there's a statistical significance there. And there is the picture I showed you earlier with the dye in between the fat cells that is showing you that there are canaliculi that are forming between the fat cells that are carrying the aqueous humor. This is just dye after the postmortem on the rabbits. Uh, it, it's carrying it to the periosteum of the orbit, uh, which is a continuous outflow system. So it's a one-way valve system, in fact, because no water can come back into the front of the eye, and it can only go in the direction of the orbit. And you all know that the orbital actual pressure is probably around four millimeters of mercury. Uh, but the space between the cells ends up creating enough resistance for the water so that the actual pressure differential between the ends of your little fenestrations in the fat tubing uh, and the uh, periosteum of the orbit is somewhere around 11 millimeters of mercury. So what we've come up with with our friends from Spain, uh, since the American uh, FDA approval process was so exorbitantly expensive, uh, we decided to do the development with the blessing of the Ahmed company with AJL in Spain. So Europe gets these things first and the rest of the world, frankly, can follow quickly if they're interested. But this drains, uh, as you can see, that they've, they've just changed a few things. The anterior chamber, now we just got rid of the blab. Once we saw that the, a, the B to B worked, well, why, why do you need a blab? Just put the skinny tube in the front and the big fat tube in the back behind the eyeball. Why waste time? Uh, that takes a lot of extra time to sew down the plate and have that big gigantic thing that can cause diplopia and other problems and get encapsulated and lead to failure. Why not just let the stuff go straight from the front to the back? So that has uh, shown great uh, effect efficacy. And as you can see, I'm just showing on the right here the, the little pathways between the fat cells that take you to the periosteum. And the big long uh, section of skinny tubing that's exactly the same diameter as the Ahmed or the Baravelt tube. And then you've got this big fat thing. Now, Bear in mind, all the studies that we're talking about are people who've completely failed with either an Ahmed or a Bearveld or prior filtering surgery, or you know, everything's failed. Okay, the, the data we're giving you is not on premio eyes that uh, are easy. These, and, and, and you'll be hearing the data as we come along. But this is the picture. It turns out that you need to have uh, the right size holes and a big fat tube that can't bend too easily, but is forgiving enough so it won't damage your uh, you know, musculature or nerves or vessels in the retrobulbar space. And it will just embed itself into the, between the fat cells. And you, you know, 
this is the length and there's the detail. And I do cover them with tutoplast, although I'm quite sure you could tunnel these things in if you have good technique. And the, the great thing about this operation is it uses all the skills you have developed in working with all this stuff you heard about in the previous talk. And, but it takes about a third of the time to do. Um, and it's unlikely to give you uh, frustrations down the line with uh, erosion or other problems because there's no blood. So we've used it on all these different types of glaucoma. And frankly, every kind I can think of, we've used this thing. And um, we've done this compassionate use thing on all these refractory cases that have failed and would otherwise probably go blind because everything has been tried. And there's no point putting a second or third of the same thing in that's already failed if they've already been on blabs. Uh, so the, uh, we looked at IOP reduction relative to the preoperative baseline, the percentage IOP reduction in medications and significance evaluated by the two-tailed per t-test, all data were included, comparisons were made. There was nobody left out in any of these data that you see here. And if you look at the bottom, there's high significance for reduction of IOPs into the mid-normal range or you know, upper mid-normal range, I would say. Um, I've, frankly, mostly in the exactly mid-normal range of around 16.5 millimeters of mercury. Uh, mean IOP to begin with was 31.5 and most of them were on multiple medications. Uh, the medication decreased by between 73 and 91% depending upon the time interval over the five-year period we're talking about. So, this is something special because you can take your worst failures and make them work. But of course, why wait? <laughs> why not do it to start with instead of getting the failures from the traditional method? Why try to make a reservoir where you presume capillaries are going to resorb aqueous humor in the subtenon space when you know there's a big thick thing that's almost like hyaline cartilage that's developed uh, in many patients between uh, the conjunctiva and the plastic implant. Uh, it's fantasy. I mean, it, the, the way you get them to work is to shoot extra stuff in there and, and create a new space in the subconjunctiva by breaching the margins of these encapsulated blebs. And incidentally, everybody that we've done these operations on, we attempted and, uh, you know, in, in, to, to inject vis viscoelastic to breach their encapsulation, and we have a very high success rate with that, which is published elsewhere. So these data are only the people where even, um, where we, we basically put a cannula into the anterior chamber, in, and this we do in the lab, but we usually do in the operating room because we can't charge for it otherwise. Um, but, but, and that adds a nice 10 minute procedure I can do multiple times uh, every so often, which is to, restore uh, Ahmed tube shunt or a bare valve that somebody else put in. Because if you do stick a 27 gauge cannula into the lumen and you inject a bolus of the entire contents of your 0.55 ml viscoelastic, you will bust through and actually give them good pressures, many cases for years to come. Okay, so all the patients I'm showing you here had that attempted and still and so rigid that, that they had to have this operation. Okay, and, and we've published this stuff elsewhere on the, on the, uh, uh, the, the, the modification of tube shunt is the procedure that we coded for. I strongly recommend you to do these things in your operating room and fix and save your old blabs because you often can, but messing around with eye drops isn't going to do it. You got to bust them open, make cracks in them. Well, anyway, I did enough of that and I had enough of these guys up there that we developed this procedure. That gives you this spectacular long-term pressure control, but there's no blood. And um, so it, it, the, these are just uh, a few of the little bits of data in mean number of medications. You see, we dropped down from over two and a half down to around a half. And most of those, I keep them on some carbonic anhydrase inhibitor um, because I like the effect it has on the circulation and pericentral visual function. So the, the, it's not like we had to have them on drops. It's like I kept them on some drops that I wanted them on for other reasons. Okay, so there's the failure rate at the bottom. It's not too bad considering the numbers we did. And um, 
The retrobulbar shunts normalized IOP and reduced required medication sustained over a period of refractory glaucoma and field, all that stuff. Uh, outcomes were superior to those achieved with successful primary Baravelt and AMET. And these are only done in people where those things had already failed. The operation takes about a third of the time, standard plates, um, and it seems to me to have much lower risk uh, because you're not placing a suture over the retina ever. You know, when you're putting in that 8 or whatever, through some resident or other is going to hit the retina sooner or later. I, I like to believe I've never done it, but who knows? And the truth is, uh, bleb leaks are a big risk uh, in, in people where there's erosion over the implant plastic, the hard rigid stuff. So uh, here's basically what you do. You, you get the retrobulbar or peribulbar anesthesia, you have viscoelastic in the anterior chamber uh, to start with, just to firm up the eyeball so that it won't go flat while you're, while you're working. And I just use a 30 gauge needle on viscoelastic. So I, I don't like making paracentesis because I like to compress eyes postoperatively and I don't like burping of aqueous humor or the need for a suture. So conjunctival expose, exposition, we, the fixation work with the A to B flush with the viscoelastic from both ends. So now that's very important. You don't want to leave air in there. That's true for all implants. But instead of priming with, um, a, you know, balanced salt solution as we saw in the prior discussion, we, we prime with the viscoelastic and you watch to make sure that there's no bubbles left in place because they will make it fail. You mustn't leave bubbles. And then you dissect the tenons capsule. We can make a much more limited dissection, kind of a bit like that latter day uh, Ahmed thing where you don't have to make much of a hole. And you just make a radial tunnel with the blunt dissection of your Westcott scissors. And uh, you, you never cut, you just spread. And then you'll feel yourself get into the retrobulbar space. And the tube will always go in the right place. If you do it correctly, there's, unless they have a buckle or something that you're worried about getting past. But in general, the, the fact is that you, you cannot fail to get the tube in the right place. Now, um, you then, once these flanges go through that last layer, uh, you feel it lock in place and, and you see that you have about the right amount of tubing sitting forward. And so then you can fixate. And I have this technique. Now, we might come up with something else, but because the varying amounts of tubing is you know, based on different size eyes, you need something that's going to make you avoid the anterior posterior um, problem. Uh, you don't want too much tube migrating back in the front, or you don't want it migrating backwards. And we've encountered both of those problems in limited numbers. So I came up with a technique where I just use the 90 proline. I do one bite through the sclera, one bite just around the tube, and then another bite through the sclera and tie it to get a little bit of a waste in the, in the tubing, but you don't want to occlude it. You just want to kind of make sure. And that way, the, the middle throw is, is really tight around the tube. And then you can rotate the knot around and everything and avoid uh, any problems. The, uh, this is all done about three to four millimeters posterior to the limbus. <coughs> so <clears throat> then you basically trim the tube and, and stick it in with your 21 or 23 gauge needle in the typical way. Everything's just exactly like doing a tube shunt. And then I, I don't think you're necessarily going to need to do this on everybody, but I do it on everybody myself because this is new. But we put in a human pericardium two to plastical reinforcement graft, and I only put in the two front stitches because there's no blood to elevate the backside. I'm not too worried about it moving, and that works fine. So you don't have to mess around ever over the retina, nothing. Um, and then you, Basically, at the end, it's quite important to uh, empty out uh, viscoelastic into the anterior chamber. This way, you know the thing's uh, actually working. If you're bubbling up conjunctiva, you probably didn't get the back tube in correctly. You know, especially if you went superior nasal, you might have caught yourself on the superior oblique muscle or something. So you have to be thoughtful. Incidentally, these things work very well inferiorly on people who've had the entire superior conjunctiva destroyed. And, and uh, it's good to kind of put the thing into a virgin area of the retrobulbar space that hasn't been all messed up by prior scarring with a huge plate. Uh, the more virgin the tissue is, the more likely you are to get good pressure control that's lasting long-term. But then interestingly enough, 
you want, one reason I don't want peristentesis made with a knife is you will want them to massage it. Not right away, the first day or two, you don't want them to touch the thing. Here's somebody who has an anterior chamber lens and a kind of interesting uh, iridotomy and a lot of scarring, as you can see. Um, typical one of these tertiary patients who receive this thing. And there you see us priming it with the viscoelastic going in. Um, I go into the fat part, the retrobulbar polyfenestrated component first. Then we go into the thinner typical thing. And then this crazy big needle is the only one they had that day. I would use one that was smaller. But uh, basically what we're doing, you can't see it, but we're throwing that triple throw um, the proline that I was talking about so the thing won't move. And then you basically do as we were just t told to keep this on the iris plane and protect the endothelium. And bingo, there it goes over the ACIOL. And I like having them, frankly, in front of the iris. The Spanish guys like putting them behind the iris. I don't know why. Uh, I like having access to the tube for future. If I do want to uh, cannulate it and balloon things up or push fluid back. Anyway, and, and here I um, just closing up the conch. And I'm sure that this could be abbreviated. But the beautiful thing about this operation, honestly, is right now you need a glaucoma specialist to do it because of the worries about postoperative hypotony. If you didn't shove enough viscoelastic in there, you don't want to get choroidals or anything. But truthfully, you could teach a first year resident to do this operation before they even did their first cataract. I mean, and this could be, and you don't even need an operating microscope, honestly. So it, it has real potential uh, for the rest of the world uh, at a time when, when we need as much, uh, that this is, gets you great pressure control, you know, that's compatible with maintaining good visual function for the rest of your life. Uh, but you, you, like everything else, there's ways to screw it up. Uh, but if you do it right, you, the most important thing is to make sure all these flanges get past the equator. And in kids, I thought I wasn't pushing it back far enough. And kids who had bouthalmus, and then I suddenly realized, oh, no, 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 no. Um, they have these huge eyeballs in a tiny child's orbit. And they're pushing the thing forward. So I, I, if I do a baby, I have to cut some of the back stuff off. I can't leave a big, long thing that's uh, adult size because there's not enough room back there and as their eye moves. So I had to fix two or three kids until I finally woke up to the fact, oh no, it's not that I'm not pushing it back far enough. It's that they're spinning it forward because as they move their eyeball, this gigantic thing with a 13 millimeter pupil, I mean a cornea, is, is, a shoving, is shoving my tube forward. So I, you, you, you never stop learning. Um, but getting that position is very important. You want to jam that thing back. In fact, you can use something like an 18 gauge angiocath or something and go around the tube, take the needle out and shove that thing back. Uh, if there's a little blood and you can't see too well, then with the angiocath, the rigid plastic, you can kind of feel it, it catches on those flanges and you can really be sure you got it way back there. But you definitely need to rotate the globe forward, look at the sulcus, make sure there's none of that uh, big thick stuff in the front. See there? Because if there is, then you'll get fibroblasts growing into the big holes and they'll occlude the thing. And incidentally, on the previous talk, that made me worry a little bit about these guys who fenestrate their tube when they uh, tie the tube. I mean, uh, fibroblasts will find their way through any hole. <laughs> so if you damage your tubing um, in the front part of the eye, you can expect to have it obstructed eventually by fibroblast fibroblastation. <laughs> Anyway, so that's this, this uh, closure technique I was talking about. One, around, one through the sclera, one around the tube only, and then one uh, back around the tube and tie tightly. And, you know, I can't, uh, it's, I wish we had some clever trick to make it so that you could make sure there would be no anterior posterior migration. But with the kids, I did everything I could, and then I found out the reason was they just don't have enough uh, volume in the retrobulbar space, but that's okay because if you trim the thing in half pretty much, then you, they, they won't migrate forward. So there's the basic picture. This is the new concept. Uh, you get no cicatrization, no encapsulation, no fibroblast proliferation. There's no blab, there's no valve, there's nothing. It's just your natural tissue with a big tube and a skinny tube 
and the big tube has holes in it. It couldn't be easier. And it's easy to slide in there and tie in position. And long term, we're seeing very nice results. Um, I would push the pressure up to about 30 at the end of the case uh, to make sure you don't have day one postoperative hypotony. But so far, we've had no choroidals, thank God. Uh, but, but I mean, I worry about that because some of the pressures are rather low day one, as you might expect after, say, a filter. But you're getting pressure control that's not inconsistent with what you might expect with a filter. So again, reminding it, this is the last thing. I, I, you got to make sure you get the bubbles out. Do not leave bubbles in or you'll have an airlock and that is going to create, create frustration. If you, if you make sure that all the way through the fluid flows and it comes out the holes with your viscoelastic, you're going to win. So that's it. And uh, the massage thing is also important postoperatively because you're trying to create these new um, lymphatics between fat cells. So they don't have to push too hard. It's not like somebody has got an encapsulated AMAD and you're you know, they're pushing like crazy to get two or three millimeters of mercury drop. If they push really hard, they, they'll drop their pressure to four. So you, know, you just want them to gently give it a push every couple hours just to sort of ensure that they're forcing these, as many of these canaliculi to form as possible. And the first three months is rather important. The more a bigger network you get, the number of holes in the back matters, the size of the holes matters, their location. So you can help them get a long-term, lifelong result of, of excellent uh, pressure by uh, doing some massage at the end, and then you prevent the hypotony problem by putting in a little viscoelastic. Just use a 30-gauge needle, because if you make a slit incision, and you, you know, then you're going to end up with more leakage. But right now, I'm just kind of massaging at the end of the case, just to make sure I feel good about this thing, that the stuff's flowing through the, the tube, getting into the retrobulbar space. And that's it. Uh, any questions? Thank you so much. That's magnificent. Um, really. I, ha I have a question here, please. Yeah. I have a question here, and this is coming actually from comprehensive ophthalmologists about the concept directing pressure, um, increase, decrease the IOP and to retropalpary space. Isn't that dangerous? to have uh, orbit compartment syndrome, because to me, you're directing the pressure from one area, you decrease the IUP, but how you make sure that the pressure in the, uh, the retropalpary space, how you measure it to avoid orbital compartment syndrome? Uh, hydrodynamics uh, would dictate that if you're building up pressure in the retropalpary space, then it, you would have pressure in the anterior chamber. This is a piece of tubing that's, you know, uh, that the, 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 the part on the anterior to posterior version, the A to B shunt, uh, is exactly the same as the one that goes to the blood of a standard tube shunt. So uh, if, if you were having a unhealthy buildup of intraocular pressure, of uh, retrobulbar pressure, that could, for example, cause damage to the axons of the optic nerve, let's say, or uh, dysfunction elsewhere in the retrobulbar space, the pressure would go up in the eyeball as well, and it doesn't. It stays low. <clears throat> so, and we know that, um, yeah, the retrobulbar pressure is around four millimeters of mercury, and if you um, force fluid into small spaces and tiny canaliculi, you can actually equate back to about 11, uh, getting the stuff to the retrobulbar. I mean, this stuff was all studied by the guys in, uh, <clears throat> the rabbits before we were widely using this in humans. So it's a great question and something that obviously concerned us and the FDA and everybody else. And at this point, enough of them have been put in and they've stayed in for many years. And I can't think of a single example. And, and if, 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 if somebody did have a high pressure in the retrobulbar space, they would get a high pressure in the anterior chamber and you'd have to do something to release it. So it, it's all a, con it's a continuity issue. I mean, the, the, the I, I, the, the big question we had is, it, does aqueous humor create a problem back there? And the answer appears to be no. Uh, surely when they're in for 20 or 30 years, maybe we'll have some unpleasant surprises, but at least they, patients look like they're gonna keep seeing for the most of, of the latter part of their uh, lifetime. Uh, our biggest worry would be with children. Um, so 
your question is a very, very, very good question. I'm not trying to diminish the importance of worrying about every possible eventuality that could occur. But in realistic terms, uh, people who put scleral buckles in the back of the uh, eyeball and you know, messing around back there quite a lot. Uh, I, I don't think there's much evidence that we've created a bad environment in that manner. Uh, this thing seems to work by getting the fluid from one fluid friendly area to another by having it pass between cells that it never enters. So, uh, but, but by all means, uh, exercise all due caution and cynicism about all new things. I think that's good, good uh, logic and it will keep us out of trouble. Maybe we could get a better president over here. <laughs> People might vote differently if they thought that way. Uh, Ray, Ray, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, then um, uh, valves are generally uh, look contraindicated in eyes with angle closure glaucoma, the shallow anterior chamber. So that why do you feel in particular that uh, that tube could be suitable for eyes with uh, shallow anterior chamber? I, I do them every week almost, um, with standard tubes and these tubes. Um, I just do, I, I book the case to have goniosynechiolysis and I uh, do some hydrodissection with viscoelastic from a, di a different site using a cannula and then I put in the tube. And the tube itself tends to hold the iris away from that area in which you, you might get synechia reforming the other 270 degrees, but that a uh, 90 degree quadrant where you stuck in your tube is never going to get stuck again back forward. So I think that's, I, I, I would never say that was contraindicated. I, that in fact, it's the only thing you can do to help some patients is to stick a big fat tube in the front of their eye and have it lean against their iris. The angulation you use is important because if you don't do the hydrodissection and, and cause the goniosyniculisis to get a deep plus five chamber, when you put the viscoelastic in, you bow the iris way back and push the lens back. Now you've got all this room. And yes, it will burrow into the iris when you're done. You're not going to hurt the endothelium if you go back 1.5 millimeters from the limbus and you angulate in the manner that was described previously by Mohammed. So I just think it's a matter of technique. But I mean, these things are rigid things. Even the skinny tube is, is substantial and it will keep the iris actually on its proper plane, even in a phacomorphic patient. Thank you so much. This was really, really incredible. Um, so um, uh, I'm, I'm going to actually, um, you know, go over a few of the uh, questions that uh, the audience here has uh, written. So um, um, to Dr. Ahmed Abdurrahman um, from Dr. Mahmoud Ratib, um, redo valve versus uh, CPC. What do you think? Like a second tube um, versus general, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think if I have a field uh, field valve, I won't repeat another valve. I will not do that. So that I, I think that CPC would be more appropriate um, because if you just think if you if a valve is failed, then what, which quadrant would be uh, suitable for another implantation? The superior nasal quadrant is definitely not a good quadrant for a valve and then the inferior quadrants are generally a bit risky. So that I think if a valve uh, a, has failed, I will not do another valve and just go for another for another procedure. Dr. Tarek, any comments? Um, I, I actually don't go for a second valve. Extremely rare. I maybe did it once or twice in my whole career. Um, I would go for a cyclophoto after a failed valve, uh, but I have not tried yet Rick's uh, tube. I'm looking forward to putting my hand on some of them and, and, and trying them uh, myself. Okay. Um, so um, also to all the audience, um, to all the, the speakers, um, do you do combined phaco deepest correctly, Dr. Yasmin? Who's speaking? Uh, Dr. Yasmin, are you? Yeah, where is she? Are you muting her? Uh, we haven't Dr. heard Mohammed? you. 
So the question okay, is, uh, do you combine yes, fecal me. with deep sclerectomy? And what are your results like for the combined cases? Yes, for, uh, he's asking you a question. Yes. Yeah. yeah, no, I didn't hear that. No, I got disconnected. Sorry about that. Can you no, it's okay. So the, the question, question is, um, combined phaco and deep sclerectomy, um, do you... Oh, that's for me. Cases? Combined phaco and deep sclerectomy. No, I combine it with circumferential Schlem scanner procedure. So I combine it with GAT, uh, but start with the phaco and then do the GAT because the bleeding would obscure, it would get in the way of doing phaco. And I combine it with tributylotomy as well. Okay. Dr. Tarr, do you combine FACO with the uh, mixed direction? I'm, I'm, I'm not a big combiner. I sometimes do that, but now I am doing more combined FACO mix than FACO deep screctomy. Um, if, I, if I feel that the patient needs a serious reduction of pressure, uh, in many cases I would start with a glaucoma procedure. If I feel that the patient is, let's say, on one molecule and the pressure is well controlled, I would rather just go for for FACO alone. And in many of those cases, we can even stop the medical therapy. Okay. Um, we have another question for Dr. Tarr. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Yes, Mohammed, can I comment on this, please? Absolutely. Because I do, uh, I do, I do a lot of uh, combined FACO deep correct me. I like that very much. Um, and for me, it's a patient presenting with open angle glaucoma and uh, uh, a visually significant cataract, and then presenting with a degree of damage to the optic nerve or is using more than one molecule, then I would go for combined FACO deep screctomy. And I like very much of that combination really. Okay. Um, another question um, we have is, um, so, Dr. Ahmed, what are your comments on the results of deep sclerectomy versus trabeculectomy? And, you know, this is a very broad uh, question, but like maybe like, you know, as a primary procedure and primary open angle glaucoma, um, do you um, see a difference in the um, success rates? I think the, the, the biggest advantage of the deep sclerectomy is safety. So that no doubt uh, that uh, the deep sclerectomy is much safer regarding the incidence of postoperative hypotony, regarding the long-term complications and to the extent that there is a case report of one case of endophthalmitis following deep sclerectomy so that you can imagine how much uh, the procedure is safer. Now it comes to the, um, the efficacy and I think there is a big a debate in the literature regarding the efficacy of uh, when they compare uh, deep sclerectomy to a trabeculectomy, there might be a difference, uh, but the difference is, is not huge. It's like one to two millimeter mercury. And then uh, there is a recent uh, meta-analysis which uh, actually compared the non-penetrating surgery to a trabeculectomy. And the author's conclusion was that uh, we could not conclude from the literature sufficient evidence to say that trabeculectomy is superior to uh, deep scarectomy. So that, that was one of the recent meta-analysis that was published like a year ago. So that again, um, my message is that, that you need to master one thing so that if you opt for trabeculectomy, now master trabeculectomy to get the best out of it. And then if you opt for non-penetrating surgery, master non-penetrating surgery to get the best out of it. Because definitely when you do trap, you will get into some different troubles of hypotony, blood failure, encapsulation, different troubles that you need to, to be able to manage. When you do deep sclerectomy, then you will get different set of troubles like having high um, post-operative pressure, you need to master go, uh, gonio puncture, so that you need to master one technique to get the best out of it. Sure. Um... Also, there is a question for Dr. Sponsor. Um, so does the age matter in retrobulbarshant? Um, because theoretically, old patients have less fat in the orbit. Um, so uh, would this be higher risk for hypotony in, in, uh, in your tube? No, not, not for hypotony, but um, they are different. It's tighter back there. Um, and they are sometimes more 
you know, uh, reticent to do the necessary compressions. And you bring them in the office and you show them, look, uh, you know, you've got to push on your eye from time to time. The, the pressure differential in somebody who doesn't compress at all and doesn't follow and is non-compliant, you know, they can come in and they'll walk in as 26, but you push on the eye, it goes to four, you know? So if you can get people to just gently compress their globe right in the middle of the eyeball, um, on the fluid compartment, not on the vitreous compartment. All you got to do is, um, you know, get them used to doing that. It's a lot cheaper than eye drops, and they will help give themselves a lifelong, uh, a, you know, beneficial outcome. There are lots of these patients where they could have failed, but we wouldn't let them fail by getting them in more frequently and doing compressions and coaching them. But um, th this is, a, it's a relatively simple thing. It, you don't, it's, it's not a rigid compression. It's not a very hard, cruel compression you need to do. You just need to give it a little push now and again to just encourage more and more of these little canaliculi to form. And uh, that will actually enhance the, the, the pressure control. Um, so uh, the retrobulbar space, however, in an adult uh, with a, a little enophthalmus and a little bit of contraction of their retrobulbar fat is actually voluminous. And so at the end of the procedure in these older patients who uh, look like they've got, you know, sunken globes, you know, you almost want to push enough in there to get their globe up into a normal anatomic position for, so they don't get hypotony in the first day or two. So my biggest worry there is, is if you're too conservative in these old patients who have the kind of shrunken retrobulbar fat, then you're going to get problems in the first day or two, but not after that. I mean, it's, and, and so, you know, because we've been worried about all this, uh, we've been very fortunate to avoid problems. But I, I think I, I can see that as it goes out into the public, there's lots of possibility for others who maybe, uh, maybe didn't quite worry as much <laughs> to, um, to, to get in trouble. That's why the thing that worries me the most is a first year resident could put one of these things in and, and get a good placement. Um, but the first year resident is not going to be able to, you know, do the right things in the first week or two where bad things could really happen. So that's why I'm happy to talk in a webinar like this where the, there's a predominantly experienced group of people who I, I feel comfortable telling about this. I, I want, I, someday it, it will be appropriate to do these things all over Africa and Asia and places that don't even have operating microscopes but for the moment, I want only the best people doing them. And that includes you guys. Thank you so much. Um, one last question that um, is open um, to uh, any of the participants who really wants to uh, chime in. So how do you manage um, hypertensive phases uh, post tubes? Um, we'll start, um, Dr. Yasmin. Well, lately I've started, uh, I started uh, my, I've, uh, going to start in my patients on antihypertensive medications very early on, from day one, even the, the ones on the hypoxia side. And I think it has reduced the risk of encapsulation. I need to give it some time again to look it up. But there's always still the question of when to start withdrawing the anti glaucoma therapy. Uh, when are you happy to just stop using it? Uh, when you're comfortable that the, the, the scarring has um, uh, kind of uh, calmed down. That's exactly what I do too, because um, there is anecdotal evidence. I know that there are a couple of uh, clinical trials uh, evaluating the uh, effect of um, early aqueous suppressants um, starting with day one. I, I pretty much put everybody um, who has a pressure higher than 10 from post-op day one um, on aqueous suppressants. Um, and um, I still see um, uh, hypertensive phases, but, but certainly in my hands, it's way fewer than before I, I started using the aqueous suppressant. Dr. Potter, when do you declare- start, Yeah, I, I, I start uh, on carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitor by the second week. I've never tried on day one. It seems to me to be a very reasonable idea. I would consider it. Um, but so far, the, my practice has been to start by the second week. 
when do you declare defeat? You know, in terms of like the hypertensive phase not going away. Uh, yeah, the, there's a short and sweet answer. Never. Yeah, that's the same here. <laughs> uh, yeah. when, when would you consider doing a second procedure? Um, so after putting a valve, if the pressure is not well maintained, I will obviously put them on medical therapy. If that doesn't work, I, um, I have tried needling the valves. They don't, it's not always easy. That's not always work. Sometimes I revise valves. Uh, and in some cases I would go for a cyclophoto after valves, but, uh, I, I don't really give up, uh, I, I, I have to say that the morphology of the valve uh, and the failure actually guides me to what I want to do. So encapsulated valves are valves for me that would I would that I would revise. But if the valve is is nothing viable around it, um, in many cases I feel that it has been you know enclosed in a in a stainless steel safe or an iron safe. And in that case, I will go for a cyclophote. So. Um, am I on? Can you hear my voice? Yeah. yeah. Um, I really strongly suggest that people get good at doing this uh, bolus injection, intracameral, you know, I mean, transcameral, intralumen. You get, you get the cannula, if you, if you can't quite get a, a 27 to go four millimeters up the tube um, before you then really push hard and, and blow and bust open the blood. If, if you get a, any, and this, you could do it 12 years after the primary procedure. You could do it three months after when they're in the typical hypertensive phase. Um, you're gonna get great pressure control in a very high proportion of patients. You leave the viscoelastic in there, you push the last bit in the anterior chamber. It is a, a reimbursable procedure. Um, it does allow me on a, K, a day when I would have only gotten six or eight cases, I get 10, you know, because I get two or three of these to do. And everyone who's done them around town or around the region sends me their failed blebs. I could easily teach them how to do it. It's the easiest thing to do. You just make yourself a 25 gauge needle paracentesis in line with the tube, shoot a little viscoelastic into the anterior chamber to protect the lens and pupil, make believe even if it's pseudophagic that it's phagic, you know, so that you're getting in practice and you're never gonna hurt anyone's lens. Then just go across and it's, it's like, having sex or something. It's hilarious. I mean, it, it's a wiggly tube and you got to get this rigid thing in there, but you can do it. You just got to be patient and people are amazed. You can fold it down against the iris. Once you get that thing in about two or three millimeters, it's a hermetic seal and you can jam the viscoelastic in and you can feel the whole, sometimes the bileaflet valve is just stuck with protein. And there's nothing wrong so, with the blood uh, Rick, at all. R Rick, yeah. I tried doing that with a Grishhaber cannula for viscocanalostomy. So it's yeah. absolutely very well impacted within the tube. But I've tried with BSS. What you're saying is we should oh, try BSS a Oh, BSS is no good. BSS makes yeah, little okay. holes at the base. It busts the base open and then it seals up again. Okay. Viscoelastic I'll, I'll pops you, it, it, pops it I'll open take you, like a flower. I'll take you on, I'll take you on yeah, your word yeah, and yeah. I will try it. You, you guys will all find this is very gratifying. And I used to do them in the office and they said, Dr. Sponsor, you're costing us our jobs. You know, you got to do these in the operating room because <laughs> we can then bill for it. And I said, okay, fine. You know, so no, I mean, literally, and, and then everybody sends them to you. Uh, you'll become a hero. You can, and, and I love things that you can do where you can compliment the prior surgeon. You say, oh, doctor did such a good job. Da, da, da. Let's just see if we can do this one little thing and, and get it working again. Uh, I do the same if you, uh, you know, have to recover a, a vascular blab with some conjunctiva and, you know, uh, or if I, uh, the variety of things that, that get referred where you can say nice things about the good work that the other doctor did and there was just this one little problem that you're going to fix. Um, this gets you lots of referrals. You know, this is very good for your business. And it's very good for the psychology of the patients because you want them to trust their doctor. You do never want to make them feel like the guy did a bad job or the woman was not good enough or something. Now, there are people whose egos make them feel good if they criticize. You weren't there. You don't know what problems those guys had. 
And so oftentimes you'll find out as soon as you start operating on the other eye. So just be nice about the other doctor and it will get you more business and you'll get a lot of gratification out of it. But you can come up with lots of ways to fix these little things and say nice things about what was done well uh, as you go ahead and rectify the problem. I think it's, I like fixing broken things. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> So Dr. Ahmad uh, Mustafa, there is a question um, to you um, about the role of psychoablation in malignant glaucoma. Yes, I read that question. Actually, uh, I did it once because I know uh, a big advantage of the psychoablation that it deepens the anterior chamber. Uh, so that um, in one of my patients- uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, it. but, but the, the word psychoablation, does it, you know, it, it, it's not ablation, it's coagulation, correct? It's, it's yeah, but you know that it is, yeah, so they, they are used, you know, that uh, in the same place, psychoablation or psychophotocoagulation, yes. You know that psychoablation is a bit more, you know, frightening uh, terminology, of course. But yeah. uh, you know that in one of my patients, uh, she had um, a chronic angle closure glaucoma and I did her combined uh, phaco trap and then she went into malignant glaucoma and I really stopped adding trabeculectomy to phaco in angle closure glaucoma. So that she developed malignant glaucoma, I went for anterior vitrectomy and then she developed recurrence of the malignant glaucoma and then next um, re-vitrectomy and uh, adding cyclodio uh, treatment and then uh, she ended up ha having nice anterior chamber, but she's still on cycloplegics. So that uh, I have just very limited uh, um, information on the advantage of cycloablation in malignant glaucoma, but I, I think this is one of the treatment options. But um, the question is to use it for 90 degrees. I, I don't have an, any yeah. experience with that. I don't really, uh understand why 90 degrees and I don't have experience with that yeah yeah um, okay so it looks like we uh, finally uh, are done with our talks and uh, I just wanted to thank each and every one of you for um, like you know really agreeing to do this on such a short notice there were um, some technical mishaps, but um, you know we're learning. It's a learning process, so um, you know I'm, I apologize for um, like any technical mishap, including like limiting the number of participants, and this was uh, very inconvenient. But um, at least we tried to share on Facebook and everything. So um, thank you, Dr. Yasmin, Dr. Tare, uh, so Dr. Much. Ahmed, and Dr. Sponsor. Uh, Thank you so, so much. And, um, you know, it's recorded. We're going to post the recorded version. And, um, you know, hopefully, Dr. Sponso, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Have a very good thank evening. Thank that you. was a beautiful glaucoma evening, really. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Lovely seeing Take everyone. Care. Thank you. Okay. God bless. What a lovely family. I'm sorry, Yasmin, I didn't have a chance to comment after your Great, beautiful talk. Great, lovely seeing you today. Oh, so yeah. I didn't do it again. <laughs> well, I was, I was trying to get lovely my thing today. working, but uh, I, I love the pediatric stuff, and I was listening as I was kind of trying desperately to get on. So I apologize very much for not oh, participating. So I, I really enjoyed you. your talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you very much. A lot of new information today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.